that was a wonderful performance thank you so much Hello. A student's life is a quilt of not just academics or extracurricular activities. Rather, it's more about how the student goes on with varied interest field. Master Ashmit Singh Bhartia, a dedicated 12th grade student at Bharti Vidya Bhavan's RK Sada Vidya Mandir Raipur, stand outs as a car and watch, watch enthusiast, driven by ambitious dreams and a fervent desire to succeed. His exceptional intellect and passion for public speaking have made him a respected figure in model United Nations where he has shared numerous conferences. His global perspective extends beyond academia as he actively engages with diverse cultures, enjoys meeting new people, and savors unique culinary experience. Recognized for his eloquence, Ashmit is not only a scholar, but a dynamic individual with a zest for life and a commitment to making a positive impact. Please welcome Master Ashmit Singh Bhatia.
in the coming decades, my generation of millennials and Gen Z would inherit the largest amount of wealth humanity has ever created. That is some 30 trillion dollars. That's a huge wallet. No pressure, folks. You might ask why. Today, I stand before you to discuss a topic that is just not relevant but crucial for our times. As we navigate through the complexities of modern world, it is in, uh, financial literacy has become an indispensable skill. It is high time we equip ourselves with knowledge and tools required for our financial success. Let us start by acknowledging the problems that are faced by Gen Z, that are faced by Gen Z, born in the world of rapid technological advancements and economic uncertainties. Gen Z is the most connected, paradoxically, the most financially vulnerable generation to exist. As we stand on the cusp of adulthood, it is imperative that we take control of our financial journeys and build a toolkit that empowers us to take strategic and informed decisions. Let us start by the first tool, kit, uh, by the first tool in our toolkit, knowledge. Having the basics of having clear the basics of personal finances are as good as having a compass in an uncharted territory. From budgeting skills to savings to investments, retirement planning, having these skills at a hand would lay a foundation for a very good financially secure future. Moving on, now let us delve into the concept of budgeting. Now, it might sound boring, but a well-crafted budget is the cornerstone, is the foundation of, a, of financial stability. A budget is not to restrict you, but it provides, uh, it, it helps us know where our money is going every month. It helps us uh, to save money for investments and savings. Remember, 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 budget does not. Remember, budget does not. Uh, budget is not a straight jacket, but a roadmap to financial freedom. Moving on, savings. Savings can be of various types. For example, uh, savings helps us cushion us and our family during unforeseen or unavoidable circumstances. Whether it is an emergency fund for an unexpected expense or it is a short-term saving for a dream vacation. It is very good to cultivate the habit of saving. Moving on, let us talk about investments. Investment is often considered the domain of the wealthy, but Gen Z must embrace this habit as early as possible. The magic, the magic of compounding works best with time. The more time we spend in the market, the more we have to gain. Remember to build a diverse portfolio, understand the risk to return ratios, and remember investment is not a sprint, but a marathon. Now, the next tool in our financial toolkit is credit. Credit is a double-edged sword. When used wisely, credit can open doors to opportunities like home ownership, uh, entrepreneurship, etc. However, if mishandled, Credit can lead to a cycle of debt. Understand the terms of credit, uh, set, uh, set a good credit score, and remember to use it as a strategic tool rather than a financial lifeline. Now, the of often overlooked by the young people, insurance. Insurance is a safety net that provides safety to us and our family during unavoidable circumstances. Having good insurance policies, for example, health insurance to cover our uh, medical expenses and life insurance to secure our family's future is a responsible and a forward thinking step. Now, it is very important to set financial goals, whether it is buying a house, starting a business or achieving financial independence. It is very important to break down larger dreams into small actionable steps, reward ourselves going through the way and it is very easy when we break our bigger dreams into small steps and achieve them. It is very important 
to have a strong network of mentors that could guide us. Connect with people, seek advice, and surround yourself with people who challenge you, inspire you. Having, having surrounded by these people who have already faced the, the challenges that we face in the financial world would help us propel ourselves to the success forward. Now, I believe in making our money the, the new money manner, but rather spend the money the old money manner. For example, investing in legacy assets. Old money often, often have their wealth accumulated and invested in assets like land, art, or cultural investments, and having established businesses. These help us forward our money and legacy throughout generations. Secondly, investing in uh, having a balance between spending and investing. Old money often has a delicate balance between spending the money and investing the money. Get that watch that you have been wanting for for a while. You are the one who has worked hard for it. And remember, you are the one who has to bear fruits of your hard work. In conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, building a finance toolkit for Gen Z is not just, not just crucial, but a revolutionary act. Arming ourselves with skills like investing, budgeting, saving, knowing where to invest, having uh, insurance policies, and, uh, and surrounding ourselves with mentors, and, having, uh, and knowing about financial well-being is not only beneficial for us, but it would help us shape a generation that is financially literate. Thank you. Well, indeed, that was a phenomenal talk. Can we give a round of applause once again for our first speaker for the day? So before we move forward to the next speaker, Ashmit, I really want to congratulate you on this Thank talk. And it's really intriguing to see that someone so young is talking about financial literacy. But uh, the only question that still remains unanswered is why do you think it's important to discuss financial literacy on this platform? Um, uh, my, me, myself being someone, who is very emotionless and a very practical man in nature, I believe money moves everything around us. So having financial knowledge at a very young age would help us and, the, and my colleagues to have a better future ahead. All right, that's well answered. Thank you so much, Ashmit. And with that, I would like to invite our principal, sir, to please come on stage and felicitate our speaker. Let's give our speaker a round of applause once again. Next, we look forward to the presence of Mrs. Anandita Maitri. She is a teaching professional of English language at Bhartiya Vidya Bhavan's R.K. Sada Vidya Mandir, Raipur. A graduate from the University of Calcutta, she completed her master's from Ramindra Bharti University, Kolkata, and a BA and MBA as well. Her areas of research lie in the language of English and education and the various nuances of teaching English to the learners both as a second language and a foreign language. She seamlessly intertwines her role as an educator, soft skills trainer, and an impassioned public speaker and career counselor as well, with a melodic prowess as a vocalist and an insatiable love for books. Her forte lies in fostering transformative connections with her learners. 
her innovative, inclusive, and holistic approaches propel individual growth, ensuring each person's unique potential flourishes throughout their life. Eliminating an innovative ethos, she navigates diverse realms, sculpting a future where inclusive learning shapes limitless capabilities. Please welcome Mrs. Anikita Metri. Hello. Well, hello everyone. Or should I translate it and say namaskaram or namaskara to all the incredible audience and the people present here. Today, I would like to take you on a journey tell you a story, rather a linguistic journey and a story, my journey through languages and words of different dialects in India and abroad. So over here, when I'm talking about it, I'm talking about my linguistic journey, both as an Indian and someone who can speak some foreign languages too. And when we're talking about it as an Indian, the first question any self-respecting Indian is going to ask you is that, are you a North Indian or a South Indian, not to say whether you're coming from the East or the West. So after all, that is rightfully so, right? Because India, being such a huge, diverse subcontinent, is an amalgamation of cultures where whether we are coming from South, North, East or West, every state, every hundred kilometers rather, the culture and the tapestry and the language even is changing. A vibrating, vibrating persona is presented to us all along, right? So here, Taking this context into perspective, let me tell you a very tiny bit of a story. What is that story? Now imagine a Bengali girl, typical North Indian girl, born and brought up in Bengal and Kolkata, who has been brought up listening to the verses of Nazrul and Tagore, reciting and reverberating the tones of where the mind is without fear, where the head is held high, where knowledge is free. This girl finds that she's getting married, and she gets married to a Telugu boy, typical Telugu South Indian boy, rather. So what happens? A journey evolves, a journey of travel, a travelogue is written, a journey which starts from Kolkata and goes on to Madhya Pradesh, then on to Hyderabad, Telangana, Tiruvannamalai, Tirupati, and Arunachalam, Chennai, and among other places. Among this journey, what happens is that she gets immersed into a cultural vibrancy of the southern parts of India, which she had no idea of before. And from what evolves from there, that is something, a totally linguistic experience, which I'm going to talk about. This girl is none other than I. I had this experience after I just got married a few months back. And so, talking about this linguistic and cultural experience, I thought, as a North Indian, learning Ami Toma Ke Bhalobashi in Bengali, and Main Tum Se Pyaar Karti Hu in Hindi, or Main Tenu Pyaar Karda Hai in Punjabi, or Moha To Sang Maya Hai, in the Chhattisgarhi dialect, I had this language barrier and debate down to a pat. I was backing myself in the back and saying, I am perfectly all right. I'm going to rock in the South. But that was suffice to say, not the case. What threw me for the loop was Nenu Nenu Premistu Nannu when I heard that. Another language barrier and a language voice for sure. All of these things are from Ami Toma Ke Bhalobashi to Nenu Nenu Premis Tunanu, translating in English to I Love You, represents the vibrant tapestry of Indian culture and languages once again. It is, you know, when I first went to my in-laws' house in South, what happened was, or my, should I say, my condition, a linguistic condition, I would rather say, I repeat the term again, linguistic condition can be summed up in these two memes that I've made for you to see. When I first heard a rapid conversation in Telugu, my expression was quite like that. And the other time, when I thought that I would be able to interact with my new family by just learning one catchphrase, what was that? Annam tinnava, which means, have you eaten or have you taken some food? And I thought with that, I would be able to impress everyone. 
Again, that was not the case. And there were many instances where this, 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 this pointing out at objects were going on all along. You know, talking about this vibrancy of the northern and the southern culture, talking about the way the languages differ, the cultures differ, let us take this debate, amp it up, and add some cultural flavors to it. While in uh, north, over here, specifically in east, northeast, uh, like in Kolkata, where we celebrate the vibrancy of Durga Puja, in down south, that is not the case. What is more prominent over there is the reverberating tones of the Ganesh Chaturthi resonating everywhere. You know, I could compare this two in a way only by a gastronomical adventure or a gastronomical example. It is like savoring that delicacy of a Bengali sweet shandesh. Ah, uh, remember the Nolengu shandesh, uh, that gur that we get right now in Bengal? Comparing that to Puli Adarai or Tamarind, uh, tamarind rice, comparing these two and having these two together. If you think about it, kind of a strange combination, isn't it? But why not try it? And talking about the northern-southern banter, the cultural language debate, well, it is something of an exciting linguistic journey, which can only be understood if I try to compare it with traversing the recipes of Mache Jhol or fish curry with samba. And trying to explain the Bengali gossip or adda to a Telugu person, ah, that is a journey and a story for another day. Let's keep it back. Now, when I was, you know, not even before, uh, like not even uh, talking about my recent experiences down south and my escapades rather down south, if I go a little bit, bit backwards, when I first left my cozy life, sheltered life in Bengal and ventured out for the very first time as a tiny, timid little girl, I went to Punjab. And it was over there that for the very first time I had actually understood the language barrier that is present in India. When did I understand that? Quite funnily enough, it happened when I went on my mother's advice to buy some utensils for myself for the first time. And I went to a store and I was unable to explain to the storekeeper what this is. Well, it is quintessentially called a shana sheen Bengali or tongs in English, but I was unable to explain the Punjabi term for it and hence could not buy it that day. Later on, I learned the same thing as an example when I went to buy some vegetables in the vegetable market and I could not tell the term khira, which is generally used in Punjabi or Hindi for cucumber in English because we, as Bengalis, call it shosha. So again, language barrier. But I find that these barriers are sometimes something that we can always overcome if we try to do so. Language, 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 what a beautiful amalgamation of culture you present. Something with words we have been using since time in memoriam, and something that creates funny anecdotal memories for all of us, isn't there? But Margaret Atwood has also said that it is the same language, the very language that we speak in, or the others speak in, that can actually result in giving barriers, making barriers between human beings, not allowing the amalgamation of culture amongst us. So what to do this? How to understand this? Let me bring it into a global perspective. Let us get out of India and turn it into a global map. Let us look at this picture over here, where thousands of languages are being spoken all over the world right now. So imagine being lost in translation in Japan, Germany, South Korea, Russia, France, Italy. Now imagine a French and a German trying to converse with each other without knowing each other's language or having a common language between them. Is that really possible? I don't think so. But if we try to, we can actually exceed this barrier by making ourselves into something where we are willing to learn something new or willing to compromise in such a way. I have personally experienced this, that is why I'm going to say to you, I have experienced this very same thing where language barriers can be overcome, where we can go beyond words. How can we do that? I have experienced it when I went to Punjab and I have seen a Punjabi auto rickshaw driver help me navigate the roads of the streets of Punjab because I was unable to utter two sentences or two words in Punjabi. I have faced the very same thing when I went to Andhra Pradesh and a roadside eatery Telugu staff helped me to understand the names of the delicacy so that I can pick out something to eat for myself. I had heard numerous tales of cab drivers all over India, specifically in temple places like Orissa or Arunachalam, where they try to speak up, uh, you know, utter a few phrases in broken English so that the 
people can get the directions to the temples properly. I have seen myself being a witness, a virtual witness rather, to numerous bonds that have been created between a German, for example, and a South Korean because of their shared love for a South Korean boy band or even some Hollywood celebrity. I have witnessed myself, an Australian couple coming over to India and trying to learn or mug up a few Hindi phrases. Why, would you ask? Because they have fallen in love with our butter chicken. Again, food unites us all, right? And similarly, I have also seen instances where people come, unite, bond, and even stay in another country because the bond that is created even goes beyond words. Language, ladies and gentlemen, is something that can unite us or it can be something that can divide us. It depends upon us how we take it. It can be something like a sign language where we can say, I understand. That is also something that can give us immense joy. Language is something that we created, not something that was created for us, right? So it is we who should decide what to do with it, whether we are using ASL or whether using Hindi, Punjabi, Telugu, English, Marathi, Spanish, or any other language. It is this language which creates an amalgamation of thought, cultural processes all across the world. And I would like to say, that it is this language which can also help us bridge those barriers if we allow ourselves to go beyond words. Why? Because language is something that was created to pass my idea on to you. I'm standing over here, but if I speak in a language where my ideas does not pass on to you, then my language is totally useless. If I'm over here speaking and then you, you, and you, everyone can understand what I'm saying, then my language is efficient. So, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you over here to come, be with me, be with me, and go on a journey beyond words. Let us see how that journey can conclude. And I would like to say, a question rather I would like to ask, like in the audience, how many of you over here have actually traversed for work or migrated from one place to another for work? Would you raise your hands? How many of you are there? Okay, I can see quite a few hands. I'm one of them. I have migrated here for work. So I would want you to recall, you know, that instance where if you're from another language or if your native language is different, when you had come over here or any other place and you found that one person who belonged to your culture or spoke your language, remember that instant connection, that bond that was formed? Ah, what a pure joy, what a bliss it gives, right? What a beautiful anandam we can experience, what happiness we can experience because of that. That is the purpose of language, that is the purpose of connection, that is the purpose of language and words. That is what makes us come together, unites us and gives us a bond that we cherish for life. So I would like to conclude with the words of Sachachit Ray, the bard, the salute, whom we salute, and say, Bhashaya mun katha bale, bujhe re shakule, mun katha bale, bujhe re shakule, ucha nicha chutu boru shaman, ucha nicha chutu boru shaman, murashi bhashati kurigan. It's basically saying that we speak in a language which can be understood by everyone, irrespective of their social standard or their position. We sing in that language. So ladies and gentlemen, this was a journey, the odyssey of my language, and I hope that by this I would be in, like, able to invite you, rather, to go on a journey and search your own language-laden tapestry. And I hope that at the end of this, you will be able to find your language to be as unique as anyone else in the world. Now, concluding as a very quintessential Bengali girl or a Bengali woman, I would like to conclude by saying, Dhonnobad, or should I translate and say thank you? Well, I think that was indeed a wonderful and exemplary talk. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that lovely talk. And it did ignite a spark in me to learn a new language. And I'm sure a lot of our audience members also have a similar feeling. I have one simple question for you, ma'am. Sure. And that is, when we think about language, in our country especially, with so many languages, our country is so rich, I believe we have 22 officially recognized languages. languages. But beyond that, we have more than 1,600 languages, languages and yeah. dialects. So 
what is that one thing that inspired you to talk about a topic like this well uh, funnily enough uh, i had experiences before also but it was actually my journey down south where i absolutely did not understand a single word that was being spoken <laughs> that actually inspired me to understand that how culture and how languages are intertwined and actually how even though we could not understand what is going on there's still a way to go beyond the words and make us understand each other languages are created by us right so it no should not be something to divide us rather let us find a way to break the the glass ceiling and do something so that the languages can unite us after all absolutely well beautifully said especially about uniting i think that is something that is going to be my key takeaway from your talk <laughs> Thank once you. again let's give a round of applause for our speaker Thank and you. i would like to invite our principal sir to please come forward and felicitate ma'am Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Problems are all around us, but so are the solutions. It's just that. we overlook them without brainstorming it meet master shreyas pandey a 16 year old high school student with a passion for science tennis and science fiction movies he is on a mission to make the world a better place currently he is deeply involved in the elsas project preventing landslide in mines with his innovative ideas beyond that shreyas is a two time winner of the inspire award manak showcasing his brilliance in scientific thinking He has also proudly represented at the CBSC National Science Exhibition, adding to his list of accomplishments. When not immersed in his projects, you can find Shreyas on a tennis court or enjoying the latest science fiction flick. His commitment to innovation and making a positive impact shines through in everything he does, making him a rising star in both science and sport. Please welcome Master Shreyas Pandey. The inception of my life commences in profound silence, accompanied with jubilation of something most beautiful, which I have never heard. Congratulations, Mr. Pandey, for the sun. But unfortunately, my ears were never been there for listening it, as it was as I was busy looking here and there, understanding the things like, oh, what's that? Oh, that's so cool. Of course, the words were not used, but the mentality and thinking was like this only. Then, boom! Three years ago, you can see a cute little child. He has a cute smile and he is carrying innocence and, of course, that curiosity. Might be wondering what he might be thinking. Of course, something mischievous. Again, boom! This times eight years. a young charming boy this times riding the bike without any license he surely a video game lover and of course at toja federal level 2 he has a dream to uh, to win wimbledon against his idol of course roger federer that clearly means that he is a tennis player but the thing which is similar is that innocence and that curiosity which he is still handling now last time who this time to the present timeline where you can see a dashing young boy either in the last last photo or on the stage too this boy still carries that innocence and curiosity but this time something is there in his mind it can be either good or even something bad means he is understanding the world and of course that mindset too that mischievous mindset now as we have completed this time travel let's come let's come down to the 
introduction and the revelation of my glorious purpose. I am a 16 year old navigating the intricate tapestry of adolescence. Ah, it's a very harsh words. But, but for simplicity, let's start with a quote from one of the most biggest and impactful Polish writer, Stanislaw. Yeah, he's one of the biggest personality in the Polish history. He says that youth is a gift of nature, but age is a work of art. This line tells that the what a teenage journey have. A lot of twists, a lot of turns. In my case, it also has the same. A, a, a lot of amount of twists and turns. With challenges and of course, a gigantic rewards too. So let's see how a teenager is created. Being yourself. In a world that urges conformity, it's important to embrace the individuality. But as we know, it's not an easy task. In my case, I, I, have, I, be, I have solace and strength in being true to myself. My STEM pursuits and uh, spending hours in a tennis court. So uh, let me do this. Let me give an idea. This get, that give me an idea for working on it. Give me the strength that I can be myself, not being someone else. Yeah, I can be inspired, but not being someone totally the, someone totally anyone else. And that's the thing which uh, you all should also do because it's the thing which actually makes you better. Now, a thing which most of the teenagers are afraid are liking it, but actually afraid of it. Passion. Discovering and nurturing passion is a vital aspect in teenage in teenage life. In my case, I I found my peace uh, and peace and my passion in stern pursuits to the to spending tennis spending hours on the tennis court and of course and watching cricket and sometimes playing too. But the thing which actually inspired me a lot are the individuals you can see on the back on the screen. These individuals does not need any introduction, I, I guess. But just for the formality, the first man, one of the most exceptionally talented and powerful entrepreneur that India have ever seen. He is the reason of millions of smiles of, of the people of India, as he is one of the biggest productor of, productor of employment. Sri Ratan Naval Tata. This name say that how big he is. Let's move on. So one of the most, one more, one of the exceptionally talented personality. He's, he's on the planet. The greatest scientist, the former president, the missile man of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. He's the reason of my STEM pursuits. He totally inspired me at what science can do, what you can achieve from it, and what you can actually learn it from it. Third guy is something who is totally close to God himself. The God of cricket. The master blaster. The man who holds most of the records in the batting history. Sachin Ramesh Tendulkar. The 90s fever. He's a nightmare of the most of the legendary ballers. Like Shoei Bhakta, Shane Vaughan and many more. And there is, there is no need of introduction that why his teenage life was so much important to creating him one of the most legendary batsmen and cricketer we have ever seen. Last but not the least, the global icon, the king of Bollywood, the Badshah himself, Shah Rukh Khan, SRK. I don't think so there is much need that why he is so much talented and why the people love him. You all know him better than me also. But the thing which connects them and actually make me something understand, uh, keeping aside their hard work, their planning and their mentality, is the belief they have. Believe on their passion, believe on themselves. Believe that they can do anything. Believe that they don't, do not need someone else always on their side to do something. Now let's move to something which is always constant in our life. Yeah, it's always constant. Challenge, problems. From your teenage life to, the, to your old ages, it's always there. But in the teenage journey, it's, teenage life is much more harder as it is your first attempt to this thing. It is the first time the teenagers felt, felt it, that yeah, it's a problem, how will we how will deal with it? Most of us change our past and let's go, let's take a, another part, we will work on that. Let's just forget it. But the best thing which we can do in this time, we can face it. We can do something. We can try out. It can be that we fail, but we can try it out. 
And I guarantee you, by trying it continuously, you can actually achieve it. You can solve the challenge, and you'll be, when you will end it, you'll have a mindset that, yeah, it was easy. I was not doing it. And this mindset give you a confidence and actually give you a sense that you can solve any challenge in your life. One challenge that I solved, and that's too much close to my life, the creation of Project LSAS. Its full form is landslide surveillance and aid systems. Just for short, the most important word which you listen in this uh, full form was landslide. I think so most of us know what is landslide. And this project actually do a, become a production predictive pre toolkit for this. It predicts the landslides that when it will be occurring or, or not by using the slope stability model. Uh, if the slope is stable, then it's, yeah, if there's no problem, you can work on there. But if the slope is unstable, it will tell you that there's a chance of landslide. Just evacuate everything. And this thing actually creates a big point because this anti Selkiar event happened. I think so most of us know about it. It was a horrible event. But it can be prevented. Not that the landslide would not, never occur, but the people who suffered there. That thing can be prevented by using these types of tools. Not just that conclude that the, it, it can prevent landslide, but one more thing which is conclude is that if a teenager builds something, tries something, execute, a pro, execute a, uh, his pro solution, so what he cannot do? He can solve a real life problem like it, I did for the, the landslides. Same you can do too. Of any other problem which you think is very big and no one is taking, uh, see, taking it seriously, but it's not to do anything about it. Now something which is not easy, neither hard. It's complex and tricky. It's something which does not have any general perspective. Nothing general info can help you. Not a Google search too. I've tried my best. And even if you tried it, you will just get some things which, is, which can never be true to, to in any of your relationship status. Not in your friendships or not even your parents. As that, because as we all know, Relationships are something which is either the strongest thing you have or even the weakest thing. Yeah, it can be the weakest thing also. And that's not at all good. So, for that, what should we do? This is a big question. The re answer is very simple, but it needs a lot of, lot of your work. Personal aspects. Working on your personal things. Thinking that, what should I do, but at a personal level. In my case, I have shared a lot of setbacks in this field. But it ended up with my with, with success, and the reason was simple. When I think it when I think it about in a personal level. Now a thing which most of us do not do. Setting goals, or of course chasing them is, is a totally different thing. But the first thing, do we set a goal? Most of our teenagers do or not. Is anyone who has set his goal by himself? It's good. It's totally good. But majority of us do not do it. And the reason is because we think that this, it's not our work. Sometimes our parents do it. Sometimes society do it. Sometimes the person sitting our back or sitting, our, uh, sitting just aside us do it. But not us. And that's not a good at all thing. Because if we do not set a goal, we can never chase it. And it's important. In my case, I have a goal that I need want to explore this world. Do something for this world. Slightly, uh, sli slightly or something which is larger too. By, in, in my case, I've done some projects and of course some volunteering for this thing. And you can do, do it. But first, you need to set a goal. And that's totally yours. Not from anyone's total influence. But from your aspects. Your, your viewpoint, your eyes and your, your uh, aspects. Now if we move further, so it's a thing which is a big problem in the recent years. Of course, due to something which, is, which, should, which we should not talk. And that's the emergence of digital era and suppressing the real world too. And we all know that it can never be done that we support a single world. It cannot, can neither be done that we work on the digital world or cannot even not be done that we work on the real world just. So what we should do? A very small word comes here, balancing, balance it, but how, the big point, how will we balance it, simple, work on your, work on yourself, 
understand yourself and then design it that I need to do some things in here and then I also know to do something in here. You need to manage the both worlds in the same timeline and if you do that, I guarantee you, you can, you can get better results than you are getting in, at this time. Now a thing most of us do not do, supporting the community. In working for totally ourselves, we forgot that we should do something for the community too. Yeah? Is, is there anyone who is thinking that he will do something for the community? Yeah, I see a few hands. That's good. Because it's, it's a big need for us. Because if we do something to the community, that's a big point. Because the thing, because the community which, which have brought us in this world, it's important that we work for them. And if we not, that's really not a good thing. So we should try something, a slightly or a big, big or a larger than that, but something that we can contribute to the world. Not in the just we are thinking, not just in the adult time, but the teenage also. In my case, I have, as I mentioned, I am building an LSAS project. And that's the thing which I, I like to give to the society. Now something which most of us wants to do, but not. Like when we are hearing this talk, you are understanding it, you are loving, I think so you are loving to it. That yeah, we will do this, we will do that. We are planning a thousand things in your minds. But after getting to your homes, do we actually do that? Do we actually work on it? Do we take any action actually? Action is a very important word, but if we actually do something on it, do we take a pure, powerful action, like building up, uh, like going home and start uh, creating a plan and then working on it continuously? Most of us do not do it, but we should do actually, because the teenage community which we have is doing a lot of legendary works, but it's isolated to a, it's totally isolated to one body, body only. Most of the teenagers do not do it. Most of us are just uh, uh, working on their academic levels and when it comes to the extracurricular or anything else they just say uh, we will do it but not for now and not for now and not for now and as the time passes and the action has never been taken uh, sometimes it's like if we are afraid of it that we will do it and we'll, it will ne never succeed but the thing which we should do and which I as I mean, with these lines I like to conclude my talk to it's slightly funny, but it's too important. Try, try, but actually never cry. Thank you. Well, that was indeed a very beautifully spoken talk. And I think the best part about your talk uh, was definitely the ability to relate to all the different points that you mentioned. One thing that uh, you know struck me was setting goals. I think a lot of us struggle with fulfilling the goals that we set for ourselves and especially coming so close to New Year's where we are all coming up with resolutions. What do you think can be done to overcome this challenge or to be able to fulfill the resolutions that we make? The biggest thing which we can do is actually as I said in the last terms, taking action. Most times we plan it, we also think it, we also do one or two days, but we actually forgot about it and let's keep, we will do it again, we will do it, we will do it that day, that day, that day. And as the time passes, we just forgot about it. That's right, we do forget. I cannot recollect what was the new year resolution I made uh, last year and I'm sure majority of us will not be able to remember that. So you've presented that thought really well and I think it's all about having the passion and perseverance to fulfill it. Am I right? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. I invite our respected principal, sir, to step forward and felicitate our speaker. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. A wonderful career is not just about getting a certain degree. It's about having the curiosity to learn more as day pass. So, here is Ms. Parimittal, 
who is a passionate student who explores the wonder of life through science, technology and literature. Beyond curricular studies, she has a deep interest in the field of biology and literature. She aspires to develop her career in the field of marine biology. She is ardent about merging literature with her career. She has several achievements in swimming. Her proclivity for various general subjects acts as her leverage. With a neck for creativity and an eye for detail, she has a great interest in fine arts. Her path has been shaped by passion and devotion towards her goals. Harmonizing this diverse interest to enrich her understanding of the human experience. Please welcome Ms. Pari Mittal. Greetings everyone. I hope everything's groovy. I'm here to talk about something that may seem contradictory at first. The inevitable presence of negativity in our life. Now raise your hand if you ever heard the phrase think positive, feel positive. Now keep it up if you ever felt pressured to shove your negative do emotions down in your mind. Yeah, me too. We all have been at some point in our life where we were so discouraged that we sat down rethinking all our decisions. But you know what the admirable part was? When we accepted it as our past and move on. We are all familiar with the concept of polarity, right? We have light and darkness. We have joy and sorrow. We have success and failure. We readily label these as opposites. But what if I told you that the line between these isn't as clear as you think? What if I told you within every negative experience lies the zeal for positive transformation? Think back to the time when you faced a significant setback. Maybe it was a devastating loss, a missed opportunity or a failed relationship. At that moment, world seemed to end. Darkness seemed to engulf you. Future appeared bleak. But amidst the darkness, did you ever notice a faint flicker of light? Maybe it was a friend, a newfound strength, or maybe it was a small spark of hope that refused to be extinguished. That positive zeal, my friend, was the positive positivity in that negative experience. My father has quite a unique job. He gets transfers in every few years. As a result, we too had to change our schools. Initially, I used to make a fuss. I didn't want to leave everything behind and move on. But as the time went by, I realized that I wasn't leaving anything behind. But instead, I was gathering all the memories and lessons I had learned. I cognized that I was connecting to different mindsets in different cities. Now, imagine a coin. It has two sides, right? Heads and tail. In life too, we often get fixated on tail side, that is the failure, the disappointment. We let these negative experiences define us. We let these hold us back from seeing the positive side, the head side, the, the potential for learning, growth and transformation. I understand that negativity is not inherently bad. It could be a motivator, pushing you to your last limit. It could be a teacher for teaching you perseverance and resilience. Just like a seed that needs darkness of soil to grow and bloom into beautiful flower, we too can use negativity as a fertile ground for our own personal growth. Now, I understand that this isn't always easy. Negativity can be insidious, creeping it into our minds, clouding our judgments, but maintaining a positive outlook at that time can help us emerge stronger on the other side. Think about it. We are often bombarded with messages like think positive, feel positive, manifest your dreams, right? While all of these mantra play this role, we, we paint a quite unrealistic picture in our life. We are left like feeling, we are left feeling like failures if we do not achieve constant bliss. Now, I propose a different ex approach, acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean endorsing in negativity or wallowing in it. 
it means acknowledging its presence it means understanding what it's trying to tell you i was in 6th grade when an incident happened i was selected for a debate competition i i was nervous as hell and when i went to the stage i saw my batchmate sitting in the audience as my nervousness grew i shuddered halfway through and that resulted me into getting hold of fear my, the my batchmates who sat in audience began mocking at me i hurriedly left the stage in tears i could have accepted i could have let it hold me i could have let it define me today but instead i accept it as my past and i here i am standing before you on this stage again voicing my opinions again interpret reality negativity as a reality check it could confront you about the potential roadblocks and challenges it could be the voice that acts as inner critic like before turning into blind alley it could be the voice that tells you hey maybe this idea isn't as foolproof as you think it urges you to be stronger and to emerge stronger this negativity also fuels resilience it reminds us that these negative experiences are inevitable but not permanent these are uh, these voice voice could act as a kick when you fall down imagine training for a marathon surely positivity keeps you going but it's the negativity that tells you hey this is going to hurt but you can push through it now think about your favorite movie book or song it is often filled with conflicts drama and tension right why because negativity creates a compelling narrative and tension we too can use negativity to to create creative and humble solutions in our life now i know what you all might be thinking doesn't in embracing negativity only makes it stronger the answer is no in fact the quite opposite is true embracing negativity doesn't makes it stronger meanwhile when we push our negative emotions down we pull push them into shadows where they fester in dark and they, they where they fester in dark and uh, they take up on you meanwhile when they bring them into light we lay here to them we bring we disarm them we take its power away remember life isn't a constant stream of sunshines and rainbow it is a messy but complex journey filled with various aspects when we take all of these aspects together we create a more authentic and fulfilling life and ultimately it makes us more human so next time you feel down don't rush to banish those thoughts away instead take time try to understand what are they telling you are they urging you to be more creative are they pointing out to your potential pitfall use this information to build resilience in conclusion i would just like to say life is a fabric woven by both positive and negative experience so let us not fear the darkness instead let us embrace it it is remember that it is the shadow that makes the light shine brighter this negativity propels you to live your life to the fullest and live the authentic life it's all about seeing the glass as half full even though it feels like it has been shattered thank you well pari that was definitely an encouraging talk i must say and especially for all our audience members who might be going through some challenges or adversities in their lives however you know there's a very famous quote which says when life gives you lemon what do you do make lemonade out of it make lemonade right so similarly in your talk you spoke about the positives and negatives and how you can embrace the negatives and take up that challenge and face the crowd like you are standing in front of all these lovely people so tell me one thing when you were preparing this talk what inspired you to take up this topic i inspired by you know literature in literature there are various aspects that portrays negativity and darkness wrong i was little bit confused that why why darkness is always portrayed to be wrong 
why don't people see the advantages of it and that made me that inspired me to talk about this here today that is a lovely saying and i think she deserves a round of applause for taking the courage to step on this stage and present her ideas i would now like to invite our respected principal sir to step forward and felicitate our speaker let's continue with our applause Thank you sir. Thank you sir. Thank you. The upcoming speaker we have today is an individual whose sense of ambition made his dreams come into reality. Since witnessing his first life terror event as an NCC cadet in 9th grade standing on the stage has been tarush patav singh's dream since our upcoming speaker a hopeful bhavanite in 11th grade pursuing science is not just a upsc cac aspirant for personal ambitions but to also fulfill his mother's dream as well having been a proud bhavanite since first grade he dedicates his extra time for stem projects particularly those demanding adept management teamwork and diligence with an outstanding percentage of 95.4 percentage in class 10 boards he's also won accolades like the ncc cm award and cws award for the best cadet and triumphed in the igbc green new school competition 2022 formerly the president of icrg raipur and currently the deputy head boy of his school he aspires to share his experiences of life meaningfully to everyone else Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tarush Pratap Singh. This is my moment. The great actor Shah Rukh Khan once said, "Umid." dunya ka aim hai which gives this very positive outlook towards this thing called as hope and sees that the world stands on hope and there is nothing else to look forward into life but on the contrary we have the legendary poet faiz ahmed faiz saying that dil na ummeed to nahi nakam hi to hai लंबी है गम की शाम मगर शाम ही तो है एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर असर्शन स्टेट्स दैट वंस अ पर्सन इज होपफुल फॉर समथिंग एंड व्हेन ही लूजेज इट देन देर इज नॉट जस्ट अ फीलिंग ऑफ लॉस बट अ फीलिंग ऑफ प्रोलॉन्ग्ड सैडनेस अ फीलिंग ऑफ बीइंग कंप्लीटली ब्रोकन अ फीलिंग ऑफ बीइंग इन डीप सैडनेस सो दीज टू ग्रेट of our generations gave us two contrasting quotes and this takes us into an argument that should is hope a good thing is hope a bad thing should we be hopeful in life or should we be hopeless in life and this takes us into a much larger argument ladies and gentlemen esteemed guest and all my peers i thank you all for coming here and i would like to share some of my life's experiences with all of you My partner and I entered a month old project in a regional science fair. A month old project is not necessarily a thing to be really proud of since we have got just a month to decide to develop our idea to understand it rather. Knowing this, I wasn't very hopeful that any recognition would come our way. But then there was my partner who was always very hopeful. She always adapted a positive mindset. and always believed that if we did work hard some sort of recognition would definitely come our way the insef the regional science fair started and the judging process also started the judging process was extremely rigor rigorous and believe me after that judging process i was very sure in my mind that nothing is coming our way i was in uh, i adapted a very negative mindset but then there was my partner who was still believing 
that there was something good that was going to happen to us. The results came and I still don't know how, somehow, we were declared as one of the winners. After this achievement, my partner was very delighted. She was going around talking to people, sharing her achievements with her parents, her friends. She was all smiles, she was extremely lightened up. But then there was Tarush standing there in some random corner and dissolved in deep sadness, in deep thinking. After I reached home after a couple of hours, I thought to myself that, why, what is the reason that I'm behaving so weirdly? And after days of brainstorming, overthinking and contemplating my own emotions in my mind, I came to a conclusion. Somewhere in my mind I had developed a subsequent hope for being shortlisted in the upcoming national fair. And the surreal feeling that I won't get shortlisted for it was taking a very heavy toll on me. This, 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 believe me, this was the very reason why I did not celebrate an unexpected achievement that to at a really high level. But this incident, this particular incident, has got a very good relation with the black swan theory. Now you would ask, Tarush, what is this black swan theory that you're talking about? I don't know it. So, okay. Let's just leave the science fair incident behind for a bit and we'll come back to it later. Now let's say, imagine. Imagine yourselves, let's say, as chickens. I'm not crazy, right? Imagine yourselves as chickens. Done? You are a chicken. As you come out of your shell, there is a lingering curiosity around you and you are asking yourself, why am I here? What is the meaning of my existence? Why are there so many chickens around me? Why, why is there a fence all around me? What is that grey building that stands at the corner of the farm? As you grow up, you hear from your friends, from your chicken peers, that there is one slaughterhouse. And when a chicken is taken to that slaughterhouse, nobody ever comes back. And after hearing this exact statement, you, as a chicken, has created a visualization of hell that is the slaughterhouse. Just imagine how scary it would be for the chicken. So, after hearing this, you are always very skeptical, very watchful for your caretaker that any day, any day would pop up and he'll take you to the slaughterhouse. But nothing necessarily happens. Like, days turn into, days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, months eventually turn into a year, and one year turns in eventually into multiple years. But that fateful day never seems to come. A thousand days pass by. Now, you are convinced within your mind that you are better than all of the chickens around you. That is why your owner loves you so very much. But on the thousand and first day that fateful day comes and you are taken to the slaughterhouse and you eventually end up on someone's dinner plate in form of a chicken curry, chicken biryani or anything that you would like. Now imagine being in the shoes of that chicken. It had all of its hope, all of its trust in that owner, in its caretaker. And imagine the pain of betrayal it would have felt when it was eventually taken to the slaughterhouse. The chicken after this thought to itself, Humanity is of no use. I should have never crossed the road. I shouldn't have trusted my caretaker. But just try to contemplate. If the chicken never had attached itself to a hope, to a trust with its owner, with its caretaker, it would have never felt that pain of betrayal, right? And the whole experience wouldn't have been so much bad. Now, this particular instance gives you a very negative aspect of hope. This too is related to the black swan theory. Okay, now I'll tell you, tell you about the black swan theory. So thousands and thousands of years ago, black swan theory was, there wasn't any such thing known as a black swan theory, but there was a black swan. Thousands of years ago, people thought that swans could only be white. But then on one random day, a black swan popped up. Now all of them are wondering, 
what is this? How, how can a swan be black? And now they had to rethink all of their thoughts, all of their intelligence. And then, in that particular moment, the, the term black swan was coined. A black swan event refers to any event that is very unexpected or unimaginable or uncertain. Nicholas Nassim Taleb wrote a book called as The Black Swan Theory. I'll come back to it later as well. Now coming back to the chicken, right? Chicken, everybody loves chicken. So for the chicken, one day of betrayal overpowered all the thousand days of love that the caretaker gave it. Like this is, like that one day of betrayal is overpowering. On that one day of betrayal, the chicken completely turned around, turned its perceptions towards humanity and its owner. That is how, that is how significantly black swan events can affect our lives. In the book, In the book Black Swan Theory, Nicholas Nassim Taleb gives us a new perspective and tells us our humans' vulnerability towards these black swan or uncertain events and how increasingly vulnerable we are becoming to these events. I hope all of you would have understood what a black swan really is now. Coming to another very close incident to my life that took place on January 9, 2020 the day where one of my closest family members, my Kundan Mama, passed away. While he was there, and if you did look at his family, everything was just so perfect. I mean, happiness all around, children are laughing, playing, eating all the time. There was not even a single thing that one would change after seeing his family. But then, that fateful day, 9 January 2020, came by, where he left all of us alone. And after that point, it felt as if the family was completely changed. The family that once was very hopeful, had a very nice, had a very positive mindset within itself, was now the same family which was always negative, was the same family which lost all its hope, all its faith in anything and everything. This too is an example of a black swan where one day where my Kundan Mama passed away, overpowered all the, all the uncountable memories that he created, all the uncountable good memories, in fact, that he created with his family. This is the extent to which Black Swan events can affect our lives. In our lives, many a times, solitude overpowers gratitude. And this very argument takes us into a more psychological dimension of what we are talking about right now. Many a times in life, when we lose hope or we lose anything that we have, we become the most vulnerable beings on the planet and we start going against anybody and everybody that is. Many a times, even God, the Almighty. I have done this multiple times, I'll accept it. And I believe that majority of all of you sitting here has done it at least once in your life. And believe me, it is nothing to be sad about, right? This is the intrinsic nature of human beings, but that is what we have to focus on changing. Being hopeful is not the problem, right? But being hopeful of everything is the problem. If we talk more about hope, hope is a necessary boon. Hope, existence of hope may be controversial, but its existence, believe me, is unwavering. There is nothing without hope in our lives. Now, Talk about a person who propagates the propaganda of hopelessness, let's say. He too, while propagating his propaganda of hopelessness, hopes that people will accept his or her ideology. You see that pun? Hope in hopelessness. That is the extent to which hope affects our lives. Being hopeful is not the problem. But the problem starts when we are hopeful of each and everything in our lives. Our hopes, our ambitions should, al should always be tempered with a layer of realities in our world. Because being hopeful and not being aware of the realities which will eventually lead us to being very, very vulnerable beings. Mo many of the times, hope inspire on a personal level, hope inspires us to chase ambitions. And the Black Swan Theory then comes and teaches us that 
our ambitions should also be in considerations with the reality of the world on a societal level. Hope inspires us to chase development for a whole community as one. And now the Black Swan Theory teaches us that even the most carefully laid out plans can be disrupted by certain uncertain events, by certain unimaginable moments. And that is why we always have to be ready in every aspect of our life. We always have to be realistic in every aspect of our life, despite and being at the same time being hopeful in our lives. So, Tarush, it is good that you shared all of these things with me, but what should I take away on a personal level? How am I benefiting from your talk? Hope, good. What should I take away? Now, according to this 16-year-old, there are two mantras that you can take away from my talk. And they are, the first mantra is, make peace with your hopes and the realities of the world. Before doing anything in your life, anything, believe me, anything, make sure that your heart is in the right place. The second mantra is figure out a balance, a perfect balance between hopes and the realities of the world. Despite how much I try to look at the world with a positive mindset, but the world is definitely not a wonderland to live in, and that is why we have to be aware of our realities. And therefore, this balance between hope and reality is extremely crucial. So, all I too, at the end of the day, I am just a 16-year-old. All that I have said today in my speech, in my talk, all that has made you feel something today in your, in, while you have been listening to me, all that has made you feel anything. It is not as if I have implemented all of this in my own life. But what I think important is that I am trying my absolute best to implement the said principles in my own lives. And all of you should also try to do that. Because if you want a better life, you should be aware of hope and realities of the world. You should be aware of the intricate balance between hope, hope, hopelessness, hope, reality. In conclusion, this hope and reality, hope, hopelessness, are parts of the same coin, but it is important to always maintain a balance between them. I would like to end by saying one quote from my favorite franchise, that is, the function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not use my days trying to prolong them. I should use my time. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tarush, for giving us so much hope <laughs> through your talk. And I must say one historic event has happened through his talk, and that is never on the TEDx platform has any speaker asked the audience to think they are chickens. So that was definitely something that was historic. But on a more serious note, I think Tarush has spoken about so many ideas related to hope. This is a simple word that most of us are aware of. But the fact that you highlighted a fresh new perspective, I really want to ask you, what is that one message of hope that you want your audience to take back from your talk? All of us experience certain unhappening, certain bad moments in our life. For example, bad grades or losing someone special in your lives. But at those moments, we are extremely hopeless. We think that there is nothing to live for in the next day. We feel like, you know, life should end at that particular moment. But at these moments are the times that we are tested the most. And if we want to pass that particular test that, ha that is going on during these hard times, hope is the most important thing. Hope is the only thing that can make you pass that particular test. So as I said in my speech as well, a balance between hope and reality is necessary. Being too hopeful is too a problem and being too hopeless is also a problem. So the balance is the only crucial thing that is necessary, you know, to pass the test. Thank you so much, Tarush, for those wise words. I think it is absolutely surprising to see so much maturity coming out of a young boy. 
And with that, I'd like to invite our respected principal, sir, to step forward and felicitate Tarush. Thank you, sir. Next distinguished to honor us with the presence is Ms. Alokparna Ghosh. The two things she is passionate about are music and psychology. Music has been a part of her life since the age of four. She started her music Taleem under her music teacher, Ms. Sangeeta Bharat, and went on for further training under Pandit Samaresh Chaudhary. She did her schooling from Sindhya Kanya Vidyale Gwalior, where she participated and bagged accolades in various competitions including the IPSC Music Fests and the Jindal Art Festival for two consecutive years. Apart from music, she has also been into sports and played tennis at the state level. Around the same time, she also developed a keen interest in psychology and went on to pursue her undergraduate in Applied Psychology Honours from the University of Delhi. Being part of the music society of her college, she also got the chance to participate in competitions at various colleges such as IIT Roorkee, SRCC, Gargi College, etc. She is currently pursuing a master's in psychology from Pandit Ravi Shankar Shukla University, Raipur. In the future, she hopes to culminate her two fields of interest. Please welcome Ms. Alokparna Ghosh. Hi and good morning. Uh, my journey with music started at the age of four years. I was living in a small township, just started going to school, and I was taking my talim under my school music teacher. In the initial few days or even months, I used to sing like this. De ga ma pa da ni. So as you can see, out of the eight notes in an octave, I could only sing six. I just could not sing the first and the last star. The years that went by were smooth. I was, uh, I was under the shield of my parents' love and care, and I was in my comfort zone. I never considered music to be a big part of my life until I was sent to a boarding school. So when I got there, I started realizing how awkward I got in social situations and how intimidating it was for me to talk in front of people, to perform in front of people and be in large audiences. So that is where music played a big role in my life. I started participating in various competitions, into house competitions, into school competitions, cultural programs, youth festivals, literally everywhere and anywhere I could perform in front of a large audience. And from being a socially awkward person, I had now established myself as someone who was known for her voice. I was able to take a stand among my peers. And that is how music turned me from a socially awkward person and helped me discover my inner self. There are four Vedas in our Indian culture. The Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Summer Veda, and the Atharva Veda. Out of the four Vedas, the Summer Veda is said to be associated with the origin of classical music in India. The Summer Veda, also known as the Veda of Music, consisted of musical hymns and melodies that, that were meant to be sung. Indian classical music can be further divided into two traditions. Hindustani classical music, which is prevalent in the northern, central and eastern parts of the country, and Carnatic music, which is prevalent in the southern part of the peninsula. I'm sure most of you are aware of the seven notes of classical music that are Sa, Re, Ga, Ma, Pa, Dha, and Ni. These seven notes are also known as the Saptaswar or the Saptasur, 
which are equivalent to the Western musical notes of Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, and Ti. Now, each of these seven notes depict a different emotion, such as Sa is for infinity or spirituality, Re is for sorrow, Ga is for peace, Ma is for excitement, Pa for joy, Dha is for disgust, and Ni stands for tranquil. When these seven notes are put under variation, they form the 22 shrutis of classical music that further form the base of various classical ragas. A rag is a unique set of musical notes that are arranged together to create wonderful melodies. The word rag actually emerged from a Sanskrit phrase called ranjayati iti raga, meaning something that colors your mind. So you might be wondering, how does a rag color your mind? It is because every rag in Indian classical music is associated with an emotional theme, or what we call a ras. Now when I'm talking about emotional themes, I don't refer to a single emotion, but to a culmination of different emotions. The primary goal of Indian classical music is to convey these emotional themes through its ragas. These emotional themes can be in the form of Shringar, meaning love, Hasya, meaning joy, Rodra, meaning anger, Veer, meaning heroism, Bhayanak, meaning fear, Bibhatsa, meaning disgust, and Adbhut, meaning wonder. Several studies uh, have studied on how music evokes these emotions in people and how people perceive these emotions. The earlier study was conducted uh, in 1999 by Bockwell and Thompson, who asked 30 Western listeners to identify the emotions associated with 12 Hindustani classical ragas. And they found that despite being culturally unfamiliar, the listeners were able to identify the emotions associated with the compositions. Another study uh, tried to understand this phenomena through cognitive appraisal. And they claimed that the emotional identification with music is based on the person's perception or appraisal of the event that is happening around him or the circumstance that he or she is in. So how do these emotions arise? What are the mechanisms behind us experiencing these wide variety of emotions while listening to music? Music has been an integral part of human existence. Imagine how many times has it happened with you that you put up your favorite song and a bunch of emotions flood your mind. It has happened a lot, right? So music can change the way a person thinks, feels and behaves. Music has a great impact on your cognitive functioning, including your learning, memory, attention, concentration and so on. Now neurological studies also suggest that music also has a huge impact on your brain functioning by enhancing the cerebral plasticity of your brain and keeping the neurons and synapses in your brain active. There are various parts of the brain that are responsible for processing music. The auditory cortex located in the temporal lobe of our brain receives auditory information from the environment to process music. Have you ever wondered why you uh, start tapping your feet and clicking your fingers like this when you're listening to music? That is because while listening to music, your motor cortex gets activated. That signals your brain to pick a beat and start tapping your feet. Music is also set to reduce the level of stress hormones that are secreted by your brain, such as cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. On the other hand, it also leads to the increase of uh, dopamine level in your brain that makes you feel happy or elated. Because of these certain reasons, music is nowadays being used as a method of treatment for various mental and physical health illnesses. Yoga, meditation, vipassana, and etc. are some of the traditional Indian treatment methods that are used, uh, that were mentioned in our ancient manuscripts. But apart from them, 
There was another uh, treatment method that was mentioned called Rag Chikitsa. Rag Chikitsa emphasized on the therapeutic effects of classical ragas. But what if a person is not interested in listening to classical music? Right? It can happen. For uh, suppose, a person A, when sad, might want to listen to a ghazal, whereas a person B, when sad, might want to listen to something upbeat. Right? So, we can say that the appraisal of the therapeutic effects of music is dependent upon the person's musical preferences. So, various kinds of music can help various kinds of people in various manners. So, music therapy is an evidence-based intervention strategy that uses music as a tool to address the social, occupational, communicative, behavioral, and psychological aspects of a person's life. Music therapy can be in the form of listening to music, creating your own music, or even playing an instrument. It basically uses a person's emotional connections to music as a tool to enhance their quality of life, improve their relationships with their family and friends, and also improve their cognitive functioning. Apart from reducing stress and uplifting one's mood, music also plays an important role in helping the person identify his strengths rather than his weaknesses and focus on eliminating his negative thoughts and uh, replacing them with positive ones. So to conclude, we can say that music not only uh, makes you feel calm and composed, but also gives you the strength to find a way towards your life and bring out your real self. It helps you identify the real you. So to, con to end my talk, I would like to sing a few lines of a song that uh, was released in 2006 by Salim and Suleiman Merchant. This song inspires me a lot and I hope it does the same to you too. राह पे काटे बिखरे अगर उन पे तो फिर भी चलना ही है शाम छुपा ले सूरज मगर रात को एक दिन ढलना ही है रुत ये टल जाएगी हिम्मत रंग लाएगी सुबह फिर आएगी ओ ये हौसला कैसे छुके ये यार सु कैसे रुके मंजिल मुश्किल तो क्या धुंधला साहिल तो क्या तन्हाई दिल तो क्या थैंक यू सो मच That was indeed a mesmerizing talk and even mesmerizing song. Thank you so much, Alok Parna, Thank for that much. lovely conversation that you had with all of our audiences present here. Uh, you know, one thing that really inspired me from your talk was you spoke about when you were young and you were trying to learn music. And I'd really like to know what was that inspiration or the story behind you getting into music for the first place? So, uh Basically, I was just four when uh, I started my talim in music. So it, was, it wasn't my decision totally. My mother decided at first that you know, she should sing. And she told my father. And then I started learning music under my school music teacher. Then years went by and I was still singing nice, good, performing in various uh, functions and uh, singing in the school assembly. But then, the real journey started when uh, I was training under Pandit Samaresh Chaudhary ji. And that is where I developed that keen interest in music that I wanted to pursue further. And then, as I told, I went to the boarding school. And then winning those various competitions at that point in life, you know, everybody know you, getting appreciated by 
various people whom you don't know. That was a big thing that time for me. So that is how. So base, the main inspiration and the main idea behind all of it was my mother's idea, and and they uh, did a lot of efforts to do it to make it well. Come I think true for me. you should really be thankful to your parents yes. for bringing you that opportunity. And in fact, I believe that you've inspired a lot of young students who have joined us as live audience and also virtually to pursue something at a very young age and be able to become you know, more and more passionate about it. But I guess that will be incomplete without hard work. And we witnessed the hard work through the beautiful lines that you sang at the end of your talk. So thank you so much once again. And now I would like to request uh, Professor Mukherjee if you could please step forward and felicitate Alok Parna. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It is my honor to invite Professor Sanjoy Mukherjee, a mechanical engineer from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Professor Mukherjee did his post-graduation in management from IIM, Calcutta, and PhD from Jadavpur University. His areas of interest and research include wisdom leadership, management by human values, Indian ethos and management, business ethics, CSR, history and philosophy of management, management and liberal arts, and alternative sources and methods of learning. He has lectured and presented in conferences worldwide, including such prestigious forums like Aspen Institute, Oxford Roundtable, Oxford Academy of Total Intelligence, Globe Ethics Geneva, International Society for Business Ethics and Economics, Harvard Business School, Copenhagen Business School, Stockholm Business School, Corvinus University of Budapest, Norwegian School of Economics at Bergen, UNESCO Paris, China Europe International Business School, Scholar Business School, Tel Aviv University, Israel, among others. For nearly a decade, he was the editor-in-chief editor of Journal of Human Values, the biannual international journal from Sage Publications. He has jointly edited two books from Oxford University Press and Globe Ethics Publications, Geneva. Please welcome Professor Sanjoy Mukherjee. Namaskar and good afternoon to all of you friends. It's my honor and delight to be here today with all of you. Uh, my special attention would be to the students at the back. I hope they're not sleeping or in their mobiles, right? So let's wake up, okay? I know it's lunchtime getting closer. So I have a challenge. The biggest challenge I have today, my friends, all the speakers have said what I had to say. I don't know what to say right now. But that's the challenge. You know, so many people here talked about challenge. So my challenge is that they have all spoken about what I had to say there in the slides. So I have a slide of about 12, uh, you know, slides are here. But sometimes I will skip some of them. Sometimes I'll say something new which are not in the slides, because many of them have been spoken about, so what to do? 
Let's begin. One day, a father and a son go to a village. The father thought that they belong to a rich family. The son should know what is poverty. Responsible father, socially conscious, takes him to a village. The son's vacation, so they had some time. So they spent three days in a village which can be called a poor village, where poor people live. So they lived there for three days, and then coming back, the father asked, well, son, how was the trip? Oh, great, dad. What did you learn from the trip? And then the son, son starts saying, just listen, everything. Father, I saw that we have one dog, they have four. We have a creek that reaches out to the front yard. They have their fields that go to the horizons. We have lanterns in our gardens in the evening. They have the stars of the night. We buy our food. They grow theirs. We have walls, in our, we love, we have walls, walls around our property to protect us. They have their friends to protect us. The boy's father was speaking. Then the boy said, Dad, thanks, Dad. Friends, what does it mean for us? Not in the slides. It means same reality. One is looking from a stereotype, conventional point of view, like me, maybe. People who have come through IITs and IIMs know this is poverty and this is affluence. The young boy, fresh mind, green, virgin, sees reality and says it exactly as he sees. This is creativity. See the same reality, but in a different way that gives you new light, new air to breathe, and fresh energy. Creativity. And where does it begin? It begins questioning. Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. So how do you examine life? Question. Three questions from the poem The, the Rock by T.S. Eliot, the Nobel laureate literature. Where is life we have lost in living? Where is wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is knowledge we have lost in information? This journey to life, through creativity, towards something, that's something I'll talk about, is a journey to questioning. First, you may think it's questioning what is around. Yes. But finally, it is questioning what is within. My assumptions, my beliefs, my values, are they okay now? Are they in consonance with what, is, what are the times around? What we are passing through, are my values matching with that? Do you have to change? Where do I have to change? These questions come. Start these questions. So we'll mainly talk about this art and science of questioning today here. Apart from I will do a few other things. So, well, this is the way. Okay, I'm a little technically. Oh. Why is it not moving? Anyway, no one can show me, it will be nice. Anyway, uh, where is life we have lost in living? Where is wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is knowledge we have lost in information? So our journey Ah, now it's coming. Fine. Yeah. So we we are living through turbulent times, friend. And you know we all know that, especially after the COVID. I won't go into details on that. Many people here spoke about my young friends have spoken about negativity and uh, you know despair, how to come out of it. But it's converting challenge into lifetime opportunity. 
From turbulence, we have to move to transformation. And for that, we have to explore our inner space. Because creativity, the source of creativity, is not outside there, but in here. How to explore it? Where is life we have lost in living? We have to find a purpose of life. We have to find meaning in our work. So that this journey is a creative journey, not a mechanical journey, not a monotonous journey. Uh, before this. Yeah. Well, Greece, 2,500 years back. In the marketplace one day, an old man was carrying a lantern in broad daylight when people were buying and selling. And he was carrying the lantern and looking at people's faces. A young boy like you was and asks, Tenor, what is it that you're looking for that you can't see in broad daylight with naked eyes? You need a lantern for that. And the old man dangles a lantern in front of the face of the young boy and says, my son, among crowds of people, I'm trying to find a human being. Apparently a contradiction. All the people in the marketplace were human beings. So what is there to look for a human being among human beings? What's the big deal? Yes, it's the big deal. Because you know, in the marketplace, our energy, our consciousness, our focus is inside out. Like when I'm speaking to you right now, my focus of energy is inside out. But when you have to explore the space within, your source of creativity within, the, then energy has to go the other way around. Outside in. Outside in. You've seen two photographs of Swami Vivekananda, which are very common here. Every, everywhere, not only in India, but all over the world. One is that he's standing like this, bursting out in Chicago, inspiring men and women. The other, you go to any outfit of Ramakrishna Mission, including here, where I went yesterday. There's a temple in every outfit. And in that temple, you'll find a photo of Swamiji among other photos of his Gurudev, of his of the Divine Mother. And that photograph is very different, where he's sitting in a particular position and his eyes closed. Where is he looking? Within. Because he can look within, my friends, because I am able to see within and I am exploring myself within, I can harness my energies and come out and conquer the world. 39 years, 5 months, 24 days of his life, right? Of which nine months, nine years were working life till he created history. Creator of the first twin organization in India. First, before the Tatas, please remember. First of May 1897, RK Mission and RK Mutt were created together. Mutt for spiritual pursuit, mission for social service. Together, twin organization. And he was the hero of that. And that organization, after 125 years, with 300 centers all over the world, inspiring men and women, went today. Classical example of enduring and trans sustainable organization. But what is the background of that? The background of the conversation. Mr. Nivedita, disciple of Swami Vivekananda, asked him, you belong to an aristocratic family of North Calcutta, Swamiji. You were a student of philosophy. You were a product of Western education. How come you consecrated, dedicated your entire life to a person who came from the village, who had no formal education, and who was a worshipper of the black goddess? In our modern language, in our HR parlance, there's no, no profile matching between the two, the guru and the shishya, the master and the disciple. So what was the magic mantra of the transformation? Swamiji smiled and gave a one-line one line answer. I felt his wonderful love. I felt his wonderful love. That is the mantra. L-O-V-E, bold capitals. Not love that we try to possess the other person, but love that liberates the other. Love that reaches out to the other. Everyone without discrimination. That is L-O-V-E, bold capital. When I was studying in IIM Calcutta 35 years back, a wise man in the streets of Calcutta had told me what he's learning. I was giving a lecture on learning, learning theories, you know, action learning, experiential learning. He said, hey, hold on, young man. L-E-A-R-N, there are five letters, okay? So what is learning? You're all in a learning institution. What is learning? L-E-A-R-N, five letters. Last four letters, E-A-R-N. First letter is L. After L, he draws a vertical line. 
In learning, you earn. You earn a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. Not enough. The L that makes the difference. What is that L? L O V E, old capital. If you earn something with love, that is learning. Otherwise, whatever you learn, how much you earn, how much you earn knowledge, information, money, etc., that is earning, sure, but not learning. What sure? Oh. Swamiji's voice was compared by the great Nobel laureate, French, Romarola, with the music of another hero of mine, Ludwig van Beethoven, a genius to the core. At a very young age, 25, I think, he came to understand that his auditory organs were impaired. He was unable to hear. And the pain he went through, he ran around the Vienna woods. Where is my inspiration to create music? He could not suffer. You know, you're talking about, you know, uh, challenges, you're talking about difficulties in life. Can you imagine a musical person, auditory organ? But he came out of it and gave us some of his best. I'm only give, focusing on the last symphony he made, Ninth Symphony. Why? There's a reason. In Ninth Symphony, there are three move, four movements. First movement, he creates. Second movement, he creates. Third movement, he creates. Fourth movement, he's trying, experimenting. First, he tries with the first movement. No. Now you can make out from that that he's abandoning that. Then, he starts with the second movement, then he rejects that. Third movement, rejects that. <sighs> silence. Silence. And from the depth of silence comes the best note of the musical history. Fourth movement. The choral symphony is called Ode to Joy. Ode to Joy. Right? But silence is very Our great seer Sri Aurobindo had said, there are two forces in the universe, silence and speech. Silence prepared. Creates. Right? So the Swamiji's photograph in the Archimission Temple prepares, eyes closed. Outbursting in Chicago like this, dates. Beethoven, deep within, he's in silence, rejects all the earlier, earlier notes, then comes with the oath to joy. Creativity, my friends, please understand one thing. Unless you find number one, joy, and number two, freedom, it is anything else but creativity. Creativity has to lead. And the third is, I've already said, love. Really important. Uh, I'll skip this. Now I come to Rabindranath Tagore. The most pro you know, prolific, profound, creative genius India has produced in the 20th century, probably. Now, <clears throat> what, what, what was his inspiration? There's a beautiful documentary made by Satyajit Ray on Tagore on his 100th year, on his uh, first birth century. There it shows the young Tagore, the young boy, Roby, is sitting in a classroom. And there's a rote learning going on in the class. You cannot see the teacher, but you can hear a gruff voice. Can you see the box? And the whole class shouts, yes, sir, I can see the box. Mindless exercise is going on. And the young boy is sitting there, not participating in what's going on in the class. Why? Because he's looking out of the window, and what's seeing? Wind blowing, birds flying, water flowing, nature. My friends, creativity cannot come unless you spend some time with nature. I mean, very frank with you. When you are down and out, there's a beautiful song by Beatles. And I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. I have changed it a little, using my, you know, I am a deep fan of Beatles, so I took their, you know, inspirationally their permission. I said, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Nature comes to me. Mother Nature comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Mother Nature. <coughs> I now split the two words. Mother. <coughs> the most creative person. The most creative person in the universe. Mother. Nine months, ten days, or more, little more maybe. Creates, 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 
alive. Then that creation. And they have to go to so, so much of pain and agony to create that. So friends, if you are really looking for a life-transforming, life-giving creation, you have to go through these pains and the agony. From the agony will come the ecstasy of creation. And the mother is a representative of that. And nature. Mother nature, the nature earth, mother earth holds me. When I'm walking down, mother, mother earth holds me. That is why it's called dharani, Ritri holds me on which I walk. From where, you know, that, that is the origin of the word dharma. Dhi, the root, Sanskrit root, dhri. <coughs> dharma. From where you come, dharma, what sustains you. Creativity is important, but not without sustenance. And that sustenance you get from this. So friends, uh, my time is ending, I know. Uh, Principal Sir is here. So a few days before his death, 10 days before Tagore wrote this. The first day son, not wrote, he dictated while in his deathbed. The first day son, the beginning of life, asked a question, who are you? No answer came. Year after year went by, the last day son, the last question asks, in the western seashore on a silent evening, who are you? No answer came. There was no answer. Friends, from the day one of life till the end of the day, as <coughs> given by our great white, white philosopher, creative genius Tagore, keep the questions alive. Keep the lamp burning. And who keeps the lamp burning? Who asks the question? We all have three personalities, the parent, the adult, and the child. Education systems take good care of nurturing the parent and the adult, but unfortunately the child, the child is neglected. The child which is within me, which stands for joy and freedom and creativity, gets neglected. Awaken the child. Awaken the child, friends. That's the only way out. A young kid in a <coughs> school, <coughs> school admission system in Calcutta was asked, three-year-old kid, the admission you know, table, big heavy-duty people were sitting. Kawa kala ki hota hai? Why is the crow black? And the three-year-old shouts, Madam, uska baap bhi kala hai, maa bhi kali hai. Why I said this? Because if the child in you keeps you alive, awake, a fresh green person. In mind, I'm saying, not just in body and physically. So keep the child away. No, 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 no. Who is God after all? The Aurobindo was asked, who is God? What is God? He said, who is God after all? An eternal child playing an eternal game in an eternal garden. An eternal child playing an eternal game in an eternal garden. Thank you very much. Keep the child alive. Keep the flame burning. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that inspiring talk. I think it was so exemplary. And especially for us listeners, the way you engage the audience from right the young aged audience to, you know, the older um, audience. I really was so inspired by your talk, sir. Thank you so much once again, sir. And one thing that I would really like to ask you, sir, is when it comes to the art of questioning or the ability to ask questions, a lot of times young children are often said not to ask questions. That's so terrible, what that's is terrible, <laughs> that's terrible, that's criminal. <laughs> Absolutely. So what is your message for all those adults or parents who don't allow their children to ask questions? The parents, the only message is first, let them awaken the child within them. Then only they will understand. Their child has been murdered, na? In the education system, in their family life, the child has been murdered. They have to awaken the child within themselves first. And that they can only do for some time during the day with their own kids. Please spend some time with your children, my friends. Please listen. I'm speaking to adults now. Please spend some time with your children, not to teach them, not to scold them, but to observe them and to learn from them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir, once again for that inspiring talk. I would like to invite respected uh, principal sir to please step forward and felicitate sir. Let's give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. 
थैंक यू सर this marks the end of the first session thank you to all the speakers this marks the end of the first session thank you to all the speakers for your mesmerizing speeches it was a truly amazing experience we will be back with more thought captivating speeches in the next session at 2:30 hold on to your seats there's more to come thank you students and teachers please pay attention students and teachers please pay attention private students are to stay back at the auditorium only the students going by bus will leave at this point private students private convent students will stay back in the auditorium only bus students will leave at this point please disperse in an orderly fashion private convent students please stay back at the auditorium students going by school bus may leave private van students also may leave bus students can leave private van students can leave
I, Somini Hazra, a high school senior of Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan's R.K. Sarda Vidya Mandir, hereby with the blessings of our respected principal sir and the school management is obliged with your banning presence. A very warm good afternoon to one and all present over here. TED is on a mission to discover and spread ideas through spark imagination and embrace possibility and catalyze impact. Their organization is devoted to curiosity, reason, wonder and pursuit of knowledge without an agenda. We welcome people from every discipline and culture who seek understanding of the world and connection with others. And we invite everyone to engage with ideas and activate them in your community. It is owned by a non-profit, non-parties and foundation. Our aim is to help create a future worth pursuing for all. It creates the best talks and performances from the TED conference where the world's leading thinkers and doers give the talk of their lives. Something that's new and surprising. An idea or invention that the audience has never heard about. And a great basic idea with a compelling new argument behind it that challenges beliefs and perspectives is what TED aims to do. For this session, let's welcome our first speaker, Mr. Shreshth Agrawal, a current candidate of Bachelor of Technology Honours in Computer Science, specializing in data analytics and machine learning. He is passionate about exploring the latest trends and advancements in these fields. His keen interest in machine learning, big data, data analytics and marketing has led him to gain hands-on experience in social media marketing. Throughout his leadership roles in several college committees, he has developed valuable skills in collaboration, communication, and project management. These experiences have taught him how to bring together individuals with diverse backgrounds and skill sets towards a common goal, resulting in successful outcomes. I'm glad to invite Mr. Shreshth Agrawal on the stage. Hello everyone, and today I would like to present Proofs of Proof of Stake with Sublinear Complexity. The word trust in, the, in today's digital era has evolved from merely being a humanly assurance to a core part of the today's digital infrastructure. If we look at most of the digital applications that we use today, we trust some centralized server located at unknown part of the world to keep our data secure, to keep our identity secure, and also to guard our digital footprint. But as we have seen in the past, this trust is not always warranted. Now enters blockchains. Blockchains allow for distributing this trust over a decentralized network of nodes, which makes it extremely difficult to break the system. Even though blockchain promises this decentralized and trustless world, in reality, we are far from being decentralized. And let's look into, into that how. So let's consider Bob, who has some tokens on a blockchain, and he wants to know his balance. To do so, he can run his favorite lightweight wallet like MetaMask. This wallet will call a third-party provider, like Infura or Alchemy, and get the latest state, get the latest balance. Internally, this third-party provider is responsible for all the heavy lifting where it runs the full nodes of the network. This is the architecture used by most of the blockchain users out there. It is extremely fast for the users, but all the heavy lifting is done by the RPC provider. Now, a question to ask here is, what happens if this third-party provider is compromised? In that case, he can simply return incorrect balance, and Bob will simply see incorrect balances. So this third-party provider is a central point of failure for most of the blockchain users out there. Not only that, it is a huge liability for the provider because once it's compromised, all of its users are also immediately compromised. 
a more secure approach for Bob would be to run his own full nodes. The full node first connects to multiple other full nodes in the network, and as long as at least one of the full nodes is honest, it syncs to the correct state of the network, and then Bob can again use his wallet to get the latest state of the network. Unfortunately, this requires downloading over 500 gigabytes of data and can take up to a week to sync. This is basically not feasible for an average user to do. So in this presentation, we will go over constructions which are both efficient while still being secure to actually achieve the dream world of blockchains where things are decentralized and trustless. So for the sake of this presentation, we will use Ethereum as an example, which is one of the most adopted blockchains out there. But the constructions pr proposed in the presentation can be used for most of the proof-of-stake blockchains out there. So in Ethereum, all of the state of Ethereum is committed in form of a Merkle tree, where the leaf of the Merkle tree is the account information. So let's say I would like to know, I, let's say I know the latest block header and I would like to know what is my balance. To do so, I can ask any friendly but untrusted prover to provide me the correct account information and a Merkle inclusion proof to the state root. And once I, once I verified this Merkle inclusion proof, I, am, I can be certain that the account information provided by the node is correct. So from now on, we can reduce our problem of finding the latest state to just knowing the latest block header, which has the state root. OK, so in Ethereum, there are full nodes. And full nodes have to lock certain amount of ethers to participate in the network. And these nodes are referred to as validators. The time is divided into slots, and validators are selected randomly, proportional to their stake, to propose a block in a particular slot. So if you think about a client who wants to verify a block produced in a particular slot, he needs to know the block proposal. And to know the block proposal, he needs to know the stake distribution table and the randomness used to elect the block proposal. Currently, there are over 100,000 Ethereum validators, and the stakes of the validators are continuously changing. This makes it extremely difficult for a client to keep track of the stakes efficiently. To do so, Ethereum introduces something called as sync protocol. In sync protocol, the overall 100,000 Ethereum validator set is sampled into a small committee of size 512, and the period, the slots are chunked into bigger periods of roughly one day, referred to as sync period. And this committee is elected for each period. The committee is responsible for two tasks. One, the committee is responsible for signing every block produced in this period. Second, it is responsible for signing the next committee, and so on. So now we will use the sync protocol to construct a more efficient client construction. So let's consider Bob again, who knows the Genesis committee and would like to know the latest block header. To do so, he can ask the nodes in the network to provide the signatures of the Genesis committee on the first committee. And once it has verified the signatures, it has learned the first committee. Then it, it asks again the provers to provide the signatures of the first committee and the second committee, and so on, until he learns the latest committee. And once he has learned the latest committee, he can ask for the signatures of the latest committee to the latest block. And once it has learned the latest block, it can use a Merkle inclusion proof to know its balances. This still requires Bob to download the public key of the sync committee every period, which is roughly 100 megabytes for a chain size of 10 years. This is still not efficient to run on a smartphone, right? So, so far we have seen two constructions, the full node, which requires downloading all the blocks, times the block size, and the light client, which requires only the sync committees, and has a complexity of sync periods times the sync committee size plus the Merkle proof size. So now, can we do something better? One thing to note here is that once we use the sync protocol, once, once we have the latest committee, we can verify any of the blocks in the 
recent period. So we can reduce our problem from finding the latest block to just finding the latest committee. OK. So before we go into the final construction, let's look into a straw man construction. So Bob would like to know the latest committee, and he connects to two full nodes. He'll call these full nodes as provers and Bob as the client. Now in the case that both the full nodes are honest, they will be saying the same thing, and we can listen to one of them and we'll be done. So let's consider the difficult scenario where one of them is malicious, in which case they'll be saying something different. OK, so Bob asks both the provers to compute the hash of the public keys for each of the committees. And then Bob can linearly check the hashes provided by both the provers until he finds the first point of disagreement. Here I'm using colors to show agreement and disagreement. So we can see that at C4, both the provers are disagreeing, while at C3, they agree. So Bob finds the first point of disagreement and then asks both the provers to open the sync committee of the last agreeing committee. So here is, that is C3. And then asks both the provers to present the signatures of the last agreeing committee to the first point of disagreement, which is C4. As the committee is honest, only one of them should be able to present sufficient signatures. Now Bob can use this to distinguish between the honest and the malicious provers. This still requires downloading the hash of the sync committee for every period. The complexity is still sync periods times the hash size plus the Merkle proof size. We can see that the linear complexity here is coming from finding the first point of disagreement. So the question is, how can you find the first point of disagreement efficiently? OK, so now is the time for the final construction. We'll build a super light client for proof of stake blockchains. So now what Bob does is Bob asks both the provers to compute the Merkle tree where the leaves of the tree are the sync committee hashes. And then Bob asks both of the provers to present the, the root of the tree. As we are in the scenario where one of the provers is malicious, the root should differ. So Bob asks both the provers to present the children of the roots. And then again, I'm using colors to show agreement and disagreement. In our example, the left child is same and the right child is different. So he, he again asks the provers to present the children of the right child, and so on, until we reach the leaf of the tree. And the leaf of the tree is the first point of disagreement. So we can see the C4 in our example. And at the first point of disagreement, he asks both the provers to again open the point before that, which is C3, and then use the same as a straw man construction to present the signatures from the last point of agreement to the point of disagreement, which can be done efficiently. The complexity of this construction is just log the sync periods. And the overall complexity is just log sync periods times the hash size plus the Merkle proof size. So this is an exponential improvement over the, all the existing constructions out there. Not only did we propose this construction, but we actually implemented a production-ready tool that people can use to make their wallet secure. You can almost think of it like a firewall for your wallet. And we call it Kevlar, like a bulletproof vest. Um, Kevlar runs in your local system as a daemon, and it connects to multiple other RPC providers in the network. And as long as one of them is honest, it will very quickly sync to the latest state of the network. And when it, once it has synced, it will start an RPC server, which you can connect to your wallet. So you can use your existing wallets, just connect it to the local running daemon, and now your wallet is completely secure. This comes to the end of the presentation. Uh, overall, the construction that we propose is 100x better in in bytes downloaded, and 10x better in time to sync. I would recommend all of you guys to try it out. It's there, it's open source. Uh, yeah, so this is going to make blockchains decentralized and trustless. Thank you.
Once again, let's give a big round of applause for Shish. That was really an interesting talk. Thank you so much for that. I think um, this entire concept is quite abused and misused, overused multiple occasions. And the easiest way for us to learn about all of these aspects or uh, you know, all these points is Google, but not always do we get authentic information. And it was indeed an honor and a pleasure to get it you know, from someone like you. So thank you so much once again. My question for you, Shresh, is if there were three key takeaways from your speech today, yeah. what would they be? Yeah, so I would say that first one is, you know, we need to start thinking about privacy and start thinking about our data rights and all of that stuff. And current infrastructure is not there yet. So we need blockchains which can really make, uh, which, which, which is a leap of like, the, you have a hope to go there, and then, but the blockchains are also not ready there, right? So we have both, we have to go towards blockchains, but we also have to improve the blockchains to get there. Yeah, and this is just a construction that people can use to get there, but there's still a lot to do. Absolutely, thank you so much for that, and let's give a round of applause once again, and I would like to invite respected principal, sir, to step forward and felicitate Shay. Let's continue clapping. Give an applause to our speaker. Now, we look forward for the presence of Ms. Vidya Arumagam. She is a seasoned strategic consultant and a business relationship expert with over 15 years of experience, fostering business empowerment as an independent strategist, speaker, corporate trainer, and expert in navigating startups, branding, and book publishing. Specializing in driving growth and optimizing performance, Ms. Vidya Arumagam excels in strategic planning, relationship management, and business development. With a keen understanding of your client's unique challenges, Ms. Vidya Arumagam starts ta crafts tailored solutions such as market entry strategies, partnership building, and enhancing customer relationships. Having delivered impactful projects for startups and multinational corporations, Ms. Vidya builds an enduring client relationship based on trust. Prepare to unravel a tale that captures the core of shattered dreams, resilient reconstruction, and triumphant ascent a testament to the unwavering spirit of a COVID widow. Accompany Ms. Vidya as she dwells into the profound challenges of 2020, a year defined by the extensive repercussions of COVID-19 that tragically resulted in loss of her life partner. She is more than just a personal narrative, it unfolds us as a journey for rebirth that she is keen to share with each and every one of you. Please welcome Ms. Vidya Arumagam. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, I stand before you today to share a tale of a shattered dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, I stand before you today to share a tale of a shattered dreams, triumphant soaring, an unyielding COVID widow, unyielding spirit of the COVID widow. I am Vidya Armukam. What follows is the story of my rebirth. The vibrant of Chennai, my life once was embodied with a perfect picture. A happy married life, beautiful duplex residence, and the luxurious travels, a glimmer of Audi and BMW, what not. My husband, a successful business entrepreneur, in business also in cyber security, I, a content wife, revealed the joy of a six-year-old boy, our adorable son, who brought into our life. My life was symphony, bliss, and joy. 
However, May of 2020, I brought an unthinkable twist. In the midst of a global crisis, my world crumbled. My husband, suddenly, aged 38, passed away due to massive cardiac arrest, and I, 34, turned out to be a widow during the COVID time, unrelenting pandemic times. Financial tempers followed, and what not, I had to part with my properties, home, bankruptcy, and also the business and the life what we built together. Suddenly, the homelessness and the bankruptcy become my reality. I also had to sell my Audi, which is my favorite car, and my husband gifted for a 10th year wedding anniversary with the name plated like TN05V 1985. That was my birth date. That still I remember. It was a very tough time for me to let go of that. I had to do that. And with the meat proceeds, I just rented out a flat outskirts of the Chennai. I had to build my career again. I had to look forward and then take care of my child as well. I'm sorry. I couldn't stop my tears. Yeah. I need to rebuild my life and then take care of my child as well. What I did was I opened a LinkedIn account. I've created a LinkedIn account, and then not as a COVID widow, but as a strategist I once was reckoned with. I forced to be. For money started pouring in, the offers started coming in. What I did was to focus more on my child and also my work-life balance, and to, to take care of my ch child and also planned my career very well. I also planned the financial things, and which was very difficult for me. My life was not easy for me after losing my husband. Losing a spouse during the COVID pandemic time wasn't really easy for me at all. I had tough time to rebuild and restart. My life is a testament of those living with that, living the strength within them. I'm sorry. Starting again. COVID pandemic made me realize how difficult the life is, how tough it is. My journey is not just my journey. You know, it is like a beacon of a hope to the, all those COVID warriors, COVID widows who lost their faith in herself. We all not defined by our circumstances. We all defined by our hope. We all defined by the ability to rise. I would like to tell you each, everyone, each, each woman in this place, and who are all like you know, having a life like me, similar, having a life similar to me, to tell you this with the determination and hard work, we can create a beautiful life. Financial stability, it was a, one of the very crucial, crucial thing which I've learned it. You know, so whatever I've learned in my life, it wasn't easy for me, and I've learned one by one with the hard experiences. Losing a spouse during the pandemic time, it was a real, real uh, tough situation for me. Sleepless nights, and I have to plan for the funeral, and I have to take care of the child's mental health, and also, like, you know, make sure that finances are the right place. I need to plan accordingly. While I was building my career, while I was taking care of the financial stability, I promised myself, I was also focusing on my son, that I'm going to give him a positive future. Every darkest hour, we will definitely have a, a way path forward ahead. And I would like to tell you this, whatever I followed in my life, like I created a support system, I prioritize self-care, and also I take care of the financial management and embrace the change, and I started celebrating the small achievements. I and my son, we decided to have a set of goals, simple, simple goals, like walking a two kilometer in a day or achieving something great, a simple achievable goals, we created it. And with that, we celebrate whenever we earn a brownie points. So celebration is very important for all of us.
I stand here before you, not as a victim, but as a victor, not just thriving, not just surviving, but really, really thriving and having a wonderful life ahead. And I also wanted to tell you this to, ho to those who feel the same way or who feel the same similar kind of uh, situations in their life, definitely with a determination and hard work, we will have a path forward ahead. Life may not return to the same way what we lived. It may not give you the same kind of a thing what we had earlier. It will not have the same effect. But with a little amount of joy, hope, love, and growth, definitely we can have a brighter future tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Vidya, for that inspiring talk and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have been truly inspired by your life story and indeed you know one line that you said truly struck me and I'm sure a lot of us was I'm not a victim but I'm a victor and I think she truly deserves a round of applause not just for the talk but for the confidence and for the power that she came up with on stage. So thank you so much. The only question that I would like to ask you today is in today's world with so many challenges, what is that one message you want to give the younger generation who get so anxious for the smallest of challenges? Thank you for your kind words. Um, smallest challenges, you know, like life brings you surprises. Life is like always unfolds many surprises. When you get up in the morning, you will know what is happening. After that only, after every day is a surprise for us. Every day is a blessing for us. Small, small things, we need not to get anxiety. We don't have to be anxious. What I suggest is sit back, relax, count up to 10, and then think, really, is it record? Is it worth of our time? It is not the end of the world. Uh, look at me and my own life. Um, every day is a challenging for me, handling a 10-year-old. Every day is a challenging. Single parenting is a challenging, and financial management is challenging. Everything is challenging. The student, I say, is it really worth for you sit down and worrying about the things? If you think after a week or after a month, you'll start laughing at yourself. That moment, that time, it might look like a big mountain to you, but put that aside after five minutes, think whatever you thought, whatever the decision you made is right or wrong, then implement it. It will be so easy. Thank you so much. I think that's such a simple yet impactful statement that sit down, relax and count to 10. And I'm sure we are going to start utilizing it in our lives. Once again, let's give a round of applause for Ms. Vidya. And I'd like to invite our respected principal, sir, to kindly come on stage and felicitate our speaker. Thank you. With equal pleasure, meet Mrs. Millie Chaudhary, an experienced educator hailing from Bilai, Chhattisgarh. Armed with an MA in English from Sambalpur University, she has dedicated 19 years to the art of teaching. Mrs. Millie Chaudhary is not just a teacher, she is a passionate upholder for the power of simplicity. Beyond the classroom, her heart lies in the pages of books, in meaningful interactions with new faces, in the company of a cherished pet, and in the serenity of meditation. Mrs. Millie Chaudhary envisions herself evolving into a successful orator, weaving the threads of her wisdom and experience into eloquent speech. Please welcome Mrs. Millie Chaudhary. Hello everyone, I'm Mili Chaudhary and I'm a 19 year old teacher. Now hang on, I'm, my, my age is not 19 years, but 19 is the years of, years of teaching experience I possess. And about my age, I'm very much proud of it. I'm 43 and I know I'm aging with grace and elegance. Now, I delve into the world of teaching when I was 19 years, not with a lot of interest and enthusiasm. 
chance. I'm a teacher, not by choice, but by chance. I had to join teaching due to some unavoidable circumstances in life. Now, imagine a 19-year girl with the kids of classes one and two, and very often, kindergarten students. I really don't know. I, didn't, I really did not, did not know what to do with those kids. They were all little monsters to me. But I had to move on. There was no other way out. Now, the, lit, the, the meager income of the small school could not suffice the needs of my home. Yes, I'm talking about needs, not wants. Yes, it could not suffice the needs of my home. So I had to uh, give some extra tuitions for some extra income. And then I had my own tuitions, my own studies, and my college. So my school, my tuition, and my college. Life was really hectic. But I had to move on. I was looking for peace and happiness. It was nowhere there. Many a times, due to my hectic schedule, I used to get devastated. And very often, I used to think that I am one of the most unluckiest girl in this world. Especially when I used to see my friends and uh, my cousins living a colorful life. There was no other way out. There were days when I used to return back home at 11 p.m. and I found my parents to be very much anxious. And that's why my father started accompanying me to save me from vices and the darkness of the society. I moved on. My, my mind was a rowboat in stormy nights. But there was no way out. I could not stop. I walked on. Yes. Very soon, I got my Prince Charming. And I got married. Yes. Now, almost, it's almost 22 years we are holding each other's hands, standing beside each other. Many more years to go. God bless. Yes. So, now, we faced a lot of trials and revolutions. At the age of 23, I became a mother. Now, let me tell you, I have heard many mothers telling their, you know, uh, when they hold their baby for the first time, I felt elated. They say that they, felt, they feel elated, the most precious moment in the life. But let me tell you, when I held my baby for the first time, I had no such feelings. I just felt she's a toy and I am responsible for her. Yes, that's what, that, that's what it was. I had to move on. Both of us had to face a lot of, both of us had to face a lot of trials and revolutions. And then there was a turning point in my life. In 2011, I shifted to Raipur. I got, I got a decent job in a decent school. And I thought, now peace and happiness will be there with me. Peace and happiness, so easy. So, I, de I joined the new school. It, and, then, and then I thought life will, be, life will be full of peace. There will be no challenges. But lo and behold, it, the school started throwing me more challenges. And I accepted the challenges with more grace. Then, there were... There were many, uh, we moved on, we moved on. There were so many challenges, I accepted the challenges. And we kept on chasing, we kept on chasing and chasing and chasing for all the materialistic things in life. And suddenly, I felt one day that we have, we have started growing up. My husband, as a husband, as a father, as a human being, as a businessman, and my daughter, as a daughter, as a student, as a human being, I as a teacher, as a human being, as a mother. We moved on. But still, my mind was a rowboat in stormy, mind, st in stormy nights, as I told you. I was looking for something. What was that? Probably it was peace and happiness still missing in my life. I kept on chasing for, for this peace and happiness. It was nowhere. In covid in COVID, in 2020, COVID enraged. Many of us lost our beloved ones. Economic conditions crashed. And we were all caged in our houses. houses. I would just like to quote Tagore's one line here. Nache John Mo, Nache Mrityu, Tale Tale, Tata Thoi Thoi, Tata Thoi Thoi, Tata Thoi Thoi. The eternal and rhythmic dance of Life and death, it continued. But it had to pass on, and it passed. And I realized, this unlucky girl realized that I was so lucky to not to lose anyone who, who are very close to my heart. Yes, I was surrounded by all my loved ones. 
my family, my friends. But still, there was something going on. I could not get my peace and happiness. One day, while I was sitting, I started exploring Google. I just wanted to calm my mind. I wanted to relax my mind. And then I got Dr. Joseph Murphy's The Power of Subconscious Mind. And which made me, which helped me to recognize the treasure I had within me. Yes. I kept on studying. My further studies brought me to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Yes. Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Now let me tell you, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs is, has a very striking similarity with the seven chakras of, Indian, of ancient India. These four, these four, the first four are the basic needs, basic needs, without these basic needs, the, you know, the principles, the, the principles will be useless. So, the principles will be useless. We'll talk about the higher order needs today. Cognitive. Now, what is cognitive needs? Cognitive needs are the, uh, the quest for knowledge and desire of learning. And when we talk about aesthetic needs, aesthetic needs is the creation and expression of beauty. And the last one, the best one, the self-actualization. Yes, the self-actualization is, is to, be the, to, to be the best version of your own self. It, it is a cultivation of empathy, service, love, and which help us to develop universal consciousness. And believe me, it gives us long-lasting happiness. And yes, there was, there was I. And these, and these human needs very much relate each and every chakras. There are seven chakras in our human body. That is root chakra, sacral chakra, solar plexus chakra, heart chakra, throat chakra, the third eye chakra, and the crown chakra. These chakras are the energy centers of our body. It provides energy to the endocrine glands, which regulates, which regulates our health. I got it. I started meditation. And I was there with my happiness. My father. My father's name is Hare Krishna. And he never believed in Krishna. He was an atheist. He met with two cerebral strokes in 15 days. And he was all on bed for 10 months. People said that he did not believe his, he did not believe God, and that's why he was he had to meet this fate. Oh, really? The person who embraced mankind, the person whose society, for whom society was of prime importance, who always thought for the growth of society, the person who always, who never gave a second thought to give the best education to his children through the narrow lanes of life. Actually, it's all our perception. On 19 December, on 19 December at 5.30 a.m., my phone buzzed. It was my mother. And I knew I lost my father. He was released from all his pain and suffering. I rushed, found my father, lay dead. I embraced him for the last time. Believe me, I still have the essence of my father in me. He was a dead body for others, but for, but for me and my brother, he was still my father. It was difficult to accept. Yes, but life is to move, right? I read about Krishna consciousness. I read about, I read about Krishna consciousness. Accept the people and the situations as they are. Life and death are inevitable. Can you really stop it? We need to balance between good times and bad times. Accept the people as they are. People and the situations as they are. The world doesn't run according to our perceptions, right? Forgive people. Let, them give, let us give them time to grow. Don't give the remote of your happiness to anybody else. The reason of your happiness, no one can be the reason of your happiness and sadness. It's totally it totally depends on us. Don't, don't, 
don't get swayed away by any other people's opinion forgive people but yes don't expect forgiveness we cannot expect it i studied about self love now what was this self love wearing a posh attire or putting a costly lipstick does you cannot you know make yourself you know you cannot be in love with yourself it's the transformation of your flaws into your strengths what i am doing it right now i have a high regard for my well being and happiness and yes let me tell you i have stopped sacrificing i don't sacrifice कर्मण्यवाधिकारस्ते मा फलेशु कदाचना मा कर्म मा कर्म फल हे तुर्बुहु मा ते संगत स्वकर्मणि वी डोंट हैव द राइट टू थिंक ऑफ द फ्रूट्स ऑफ आवर एक्शन वी ओनली हैव द राइट टू डू द एक्शंस आई स्टार्टेड फॉलोइंग दिस प्रिंसिपल आई पुट ऑल माय एफर्ट्स इन डूइंग एक्शंस एंड आई हैव स्टॉप्ड एक्सपेक्टिंग वैलिडेशंस एंड यस आई गेट माय हैप्पीनेस आई डोंट एक्सपेक्ट appreciations it will come on its way it will come on its way we keep on fretting thinking about the next day the next moment what is going to be the next moment what is going to happen in the next day and we keep on fearing about all this let me tell you come out of fear fear it will not it will end up your life i'm telling you it will fear not that your life will will be a, will be will come to an end but fear that it will not let you to begin use your energy don't waste your energy to in, in fearing the things in getting scared use your energy to manifest to believe to love to grow to glow i pay my gratitude to the universe for giving me each and every situations of my life i am no more i am no more a teacher of i am no more a 19 year old teacher who thinks as students as little monsters now i am a passionate teacher who is equipped with love power knowledge and above all austerity i am no more a mother of 23 23 years old i i enjoy each and every step of my motherhood as i see my daughter growing up with dignity and elegance and above all a beautiful human being each and every woman should go through this path whether you give birth or not yes i am powerful i am happy i create my own reality i am healthy i am full of energy and before i wrap up my talk i just feel my father Hare Krishna standing beside me holding my hand and Shri Krishna embracing me each and every moment of life thank you thank you so much for that lovely talk ma'am and i think that the way you shared your journey of self exploration and self awareness was truly inspiring and intriguing and when it comes to maslow's hierarchy of needs i would really like to understand ma'am what brought you to it as i told you you know when i was totally as i told my mind was a robot in stormy night i was all restless even after covid you know uh, there were situations but you know which were all calm down but i was totally restless i wanted happiness within i could not get it and i started reading and i have become a voracious reader now and i was just exploring i get a lot of book you know so there is a book what children want from you and in that book i got this maslow's hierarchy of human needs well that's wonderfully said and i think with that we completely resonate with the idea that you've shared about self love but not being you know overly loving towards yourself but yes. also loving others and with that we come to the felicitation i would like to request our respected principal sir to kindly step forward and felicitate ma'am let's give her a round of applause Thank you sir.
Thanks. You? Next, we look forward to the benign presence of Mr. Ajay Arora, who is a qualified management practitioner and a mechanical engineer, having nearly three decades of rich experience in industry. He started his professional journey at Maruti Suzuki, India's leading car manufacturing company. After having been grounded in operation, he moved within the organization to its strategic initiative groups and played a key role in finalizing the growth strategies for the organization. This was followed by a role at GMR, the infrastructure giant in India, wherein he focused largely on developing plans for the revenue enhancement, both through arrow and non-arrow streams, as a part of the business strategy for as a part of the business strategy for GMRS Airports business, while also optimizing cost. Since last decade, he has been with Hero Enterprise, a brand largely known for two-wheelers, but having diversified business interest. Currently, the Vice President for Strategic Projects at Hero, he is focused on expansion and diversification while help troubleshoot operations. An avid reader and traveller, Mr. Ajay Arora takes keen interest in sports, having successfully completed over a dozen marathons, including the globally acclaimed Berlin Marathon. Among one of the six World Marathon majors, apart from cycling championships, mentoring the younger generation, professionally and otherwise is his passion. He has coached quite a few to graduate from being a couch potato to a marathoner. Leading India corporates and B schools, including the reputed ISB, have invited him to interact with the C-suit professionals around his uniquely developed modules around agility in strategy and enhan enhancing competitiveness through sports, which have become very popular. I hope you are all excited as I am for the insights we are about to gain. We request sir to please come on the stage. Ooh, I'm in the hot seat. Uh, not hot seat practically, I should say in the spotlight. I'm in the spotlight. Uh, well, uh, as I'm on the spotlight, I'm uh, reminded of what uh, Bill Clinton, uh, the former U.S. president, once said. That uh, even he was speaking to thousands of delegations, internationally acclaimed people and leaders, still he would get butterflies in his stomach whenever he would go on the stage. So uh, I would also say that I've got not butterflies, but at least some caterpillars or some lavas or some chota butterflies are still around. Huh? I must admit that. But uh, so, friends, uh, when I got this invite, to come on TED, the globally acclaimed platform, come and talk about my experiences. I got so many suggestions, so many inputs on what we should be doing when you go on the stage, make these kind of slides, talk about this, rehearse a speech. Someone uh, told me that there is a, even a book on how, what to speak on TED. Uh, someone even sent me a video on what to speak. That was a TED video. So it was, on what to speak on TED platform while not speaking anything. You know, those kind of things are also there. But I feel that if you speak your heart out, if you talk about your passion, you don't have to prepare that well. You, it automatically flows from you. And that's what, friends, I'm going to talk about today, is moving the mountain. Uh, that's what my journey is going to be. And I'm going to talk about journey of different people as well. Before we get into the discussion, uh, let me understand from uh, all of you who are present physically here, and others who are watching this virtually. How many of you want to achieve something in life? We can have it a show of hands. Uh, okay, almost all of them. And people virtually also, I'm sure, all of them, we want to achieve something in our life. A student may want to achieve a particular grade. Uh, a businessman would want to have a million dollars in his bank account. A social activist may want to, uh, you know, have, his, have the lives of millions of people impacted by his work. So everybody, because human beings want to achieve something, we have that des innate desire for us to achieve something. Now, for achieving that, since you have your goal and target and everything in front of you, would you it d needs a certain capacity to do that, right? Do you know what is your capacity? I don't think so anybody would know the capacity. 
because naturally we don't have a designed capacity unlike a car which has got a cc or a bhp a uh, uh, a plane which would have flying range a computer which would have a ram or, or a computing capacity human beings like us homo sapiens are not designed to have a defined capacity because our capacity increases with every generation with, with lot of hard work and practice is what we put and with that practice is my friends we can move the mountain as well in the generations to come i'm sure you will ad admit to that as we go along you must all be thinking uh, why this fellow is in this age of chat gpt ai and where you can th move things by the click of button even you know uh, machine learning is outsourcing your thinking as well you know whatever you were to think why is this fellow th talking about moving the mountain friends i am going to talk of moving the mountain the mental way moving the mountain in the mind and for that i am going to use the metaphor of a marathon which is something which i have been doing and which is what i encourage a lot of people to do that friends a uh, marathon i'm sure a lot of you would have heard marathon is a race and a place and both are connected the uh, race is 26.2 miles uh, 42.195 km and mind you when you're running a race for that distance 42.195 km every meter counts every meter counts when your legs hurt and everything hurts you have to still go on the distance and the place uh, the story goes like this in 5th century bc uh, there was a battle of marathon which was between greeks and persians and both of them actually claimed to have won that war it's been uh, 2500 years ago it's difficult to prove who won but the story goes like this towards the end of the war a greek soldier come messenger he ran from athens to marathon a distance of 26.2 miles which is exactly the distance he ran non stop there and announced that we have won and as he announced he collapsed and died ever since that this distance has been fascinating human beings this distance has become a sacrosanct thing and human beings want to win win over this uh, race on on themselves it's not a race with others so every year after that uh, you know modern olympics started in 1896 and marathon was a one of the first events which was part of that even now also every olympics uh, marathon is one of the last uh, events which happen just before the closing ceremony that's the kind of importance that it has there are 800 marathons across the world happening every year uh, including the uh, the what what uh, was announced the including the renowned boston marathon which is the oldest it started in 1897 followed by the berlin marathon the london marathon the uh, you got chicago and new york and the tokyo the six world majors and i'm proud to say that i ran one of them the berlin marathon just a couple of months ago so friends you must be thinking why is this guy talking about marathon when so many marath when 1.1 million people run marathon every year you know so many people and it's increasing amateurs run marathon it's not the professional athletes as well why is this guy talking about marathon for that i'll take a minute a pause here and i'll show you some pictures friends i'm sure some of you would be able to recognize uh, some of them and a few of them would be able to recognize all of them what is it connects which connects all of them except that they are successful in their own life you've got a a business successful businessman uh, uh, you've got people all across the world what is the one thing which connects besides the fact that they're all successful in their own walks of life the successful thing uh, the most important thing among all of them is that my friends they are all marathon runners they're all marathon runners from us uh, from the chairman of tata sons which is the biggest uh, business house that we have from a banker to an entrepreneur to a tv host uh, to a model and as well as going up to the former us president george w bush all of them have been a marathon runners why would they run this marathon you know why would they do this if uh, 42.195 km i'm going to emphasize it again and again uh, it's not easy you you go through a grill you practice for almost a year uh, you know you eat less uh, i mean eat uh, not less i would say you eat nutritional food you don't go out for late nights you know you do all those kind of things why would you sacrifice everything uh, this is a lot uh, this so n chandra who's pictured here uh, who's chairman of tata sons he says marathon is the best thing which has happened to him he says like the way in a business you've got to keep the balance sheet fit to have a healthy pnl 
in a marathon, you have to keep your body fit if you have to go the distance. You know, uh, Nitin Kamath, who is the uh, founder of Zeroda, is a technology company uh, in India. He says life is like a marathon. If you run too fast, you burn out. If you run too slow, you are left behind. So you've got to go at your own pace. So my friends, marathon is your own race. You are fighting with yourself. You are fighting with your mind. You are fighting uh, with all the might in your, in your hand. So that's very important. And a lot of people talk about marathon as their meditation. A lot of people say that it gives them a me time. Uh, I consider this marathon as my plan for the day. Whatever I have to do during the day, I would plan during my morning run. And that's it. So, my friends, it's, it took, uh, what we get from this is professional success in everything that you're doing, whether a student, whether a teacher, whether a businessman, whether a social activist, whatever you're doing or you're in armed forces, your success needs perseverance, consistency, and the ability to never let go. Never let go against challenges and adversity. In fact, that is one thing which distinguishes our perseverance of human beings, the homo sapiens that we have, is that distinguishes human beings against all animals. There is a science behind that as well. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, as you look at it, there are kids uh, of five years old, Budhya Singh, uh, who's run a marathon. Some women have been running in sari. Uh, 100-year-old Fauja Singh has been running marathon. And in fact, this morning I did a 10K run. And uh, friends, I'm glad to share. I ran with a girl from this very town and she told me she ran a half marathon while she was pregnant and she would get to know. And no doubt the child is named Marathon. It's a marathon child. So friends, that's a kind of joy that you get in running. Phil Knight says, a word would be, Phil Knight, who's a founder of Nike, Nike is the, uh, word would be a better place if everybody ran a few miles every day. Because it literally liberates you, our two limbs. They take you miles and miles everywhere. So friends, this is, a, there's a science behind it, like what I was saying. The science is that uh, between human beings and animals, uh, animals cool their body by panting. You would have noticed horse, ha, 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 ha. We cool our body by sweating. We don't uh, have to pant, right? And because of this, we are able to go a distance. So while our speed, we will not be able to out sprint a horse, but we can go a longer distance. On a, ho on a warmer day, when you are able to cool your body, the distance that you do it might be much higher than a horse. So, you know, and that's comparable to all the other animals as well, because human beings have that very little capability. And besides the sweating, it's a perseverance to never let go against any, any challenge. So, friends, it starts with the science, it gets into your mind, and then it becomes an addiction. And for, I'm, I'm glad to say, glad to say here, the biggest addict of this marathon race is here. You pictured here and standing in front of you. That's what friends, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, this kind of addiction, every parent would want his child to have. Every sibling would want his sibling to have. And I would never be able to give it up. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I have. So friends, uh, I'm, now if, before we come to a closure, let me ask a question again. How many of you would want to take vitamins or nutrients in place of steroids or antibiotics or painkillers? I'm sure everybody would want to take a vitamin, which is a, which is a preventive medicine, which is making you stronger. So friends, this marathon is a vitamin M, vitamin M in your life. So please do take vitamin M, vitamin marathon. And because of this, you will be able to move the mountain in your mind. So it's uh, moving the mountain in your mind through marathon. Thank you very much, my friends. Thank you so much, sir, for that eye-opening talk. Thank you. It was indeed an inspiring talk. Yeah. And I must say that uh, you made us aware of the mountain that we have yeah. of living yeah. a sedentary lifestyle yeah. and yeah. laziness. And uh, one thing that you would like to say was your biggest mantra in life. What would that be? Uh, never give up, my friends. Never give up. In against every... So, uh, if, if you're going a marathon, okay, I'll take a metaphor of marathon, or, or if you're doing something else in your life, never give up. You run, you walk, you crawl, but don't give up. That's because that's a mantra of life, my friends. Never give up. Because when you give up, you die. 
so please never give up my friends absolutely thank you, thank you so much sir for thank once you. again inspiring us thank and you. with that i would like to invite our respected principal sir to kindly come forward and felicitate sir let's give him a round of applause thank you please do run the marathon in your life that's my mantra thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you thank you raipur thank you thank you sir thank you thank you so Taking the best of the opportunities offered and shaping yourself is what an avid young STEM researcher in 11th grade aspires to do. Ms. Soumya has embarked on a journey exploring the realms of science and advocacy. Last year, she had the honor of visiting ISRO, delving into the marvels of space exploration. Additionally, representing Team India at ICEF was an incredible milestone where her team secured a grant award showcasing our dedication to scientific innovation her passion extends beyond stem she delves into gender studies recognizing its vital importance in today's world alongside photography serves as her creative outlet capturing movements that inspire change currently her projects revolve around creating detection methods and raising awareness for various gynecological conditions merging her scientific curiosity with a drive for social impact Please welcome Ms. Soumya Agrawal. Travelling in a public bus, long back when I was a kid, of course I am a kid even today, but that time i was younger than my present age i witnessed a situation which i could not understand at that interval but today it is depicted in this visual a set of seats were reserved for women and on one of those seats a woman was relaxing herself while a man who was really tired was still standing as humanity teaches us the woman should have adjusted her comfort and allowed the man to take the seat not the whole but a part of it but unluckily the things did not go that way no one was actually bothered to help the man out being a child it was really difficult for me to understand the situation but today standing here as a 16 year old that does make some sense to me Women empowerment is definitely a topic which is over spoken today. But do you really think it is the need of the 21st century? Is it still valid to have the same traditional notion about the conditions of women in the society? With due respect to all the policies and norms that are being practiced and discussed upon I should say that the answer in my view remains a big no. I'm pretty sure you all must be like here comes again a talk on women empowerment to give them their rights so on and so forth. But trust me, I don't stand here to say anything that is for or against the topic of women empowerment. Rather, I stand here to share my experiences that will help you shape your actions and your perspectives in order to establish gender equality. Over the years, the concept of women empowerment has definitely been enforced all across the globe. The best example we all know about is that of the Scandinavian countries. Women in this region have not only proven themselves politically, but have also been grabbing the highest positions in their economy words differently arranged have different meanings and meanings differently arranged have different impacts it is
is a beautiful quote which was given by Blaise Pascal and it perfectly defines our current day situation. Often while speaking about the terminologies of women empowerment and feminism, we misinterpret them. And that holds us back from witnessing a change due to these ideas. What do you think is the true meaning of these two terminologies? As given by the Oxford University, women empowerment is the delegation of authority to someone to enable them to deal with their situations on their own. While feminism, on the other hand, is the belief in social, economic and political equality for genders. But, do you really think we are enforcing these ideas the way they are actually defined? Again, the answer remains a big no. In the realm of equality for gender, we have always been trying to turn the society and give privileges to women rather than serving them on the same line as that of the men. A few days back, we had a literature festival in our school where I had the honor to meet a mime artist. During a casual discussion with him, he beautifully justified himself wearing girls baggy trousers. He said that, if being a man, I don't stop girls and ladies from buying a piece of cloth from the men's section, then why should I be ashamed of wearing their baggy trousers if that comforts me in my performance? And that is actually true. If equality has to exist, why not have it in all the grounds? Why make exceptions in reserved seats, in the clothes we wear, or the broader and the narrower smiles we possess? I would hereby like to share two more incidents of my life. The first one I guess most of us can relate to as well. On my way back home, I saw a roadside accident. Don't worry, it was a minor one. There was a girl and a boy on their vehicles who crashed. Now, as an observer, I knew that the mistake was that of the girl because she forgot to give the indicator. But the whole blame shifted on the boy. The second incident that I'll be sharing here today is a bit personal to me. Two years back, I visited my dentist and he persuaded me to get myself braces. He said that, being a girl, a broad smile did not suit me. Do you think so? Of course not, I believe. Though I could not answer him that day, with standing here through this platform, I would like to share those segments that the society has made, not just for the females, but for the males too. And the day we break through all these segments is the day when no force can stop gender equality from coming into existence. We often complain that people don't consider gynecological health, specifically periods, to be normal. According to a recent survey that was conducted by the Hindu along with the Cry Foundation, said that 61% of the girls consider menstruation to be a social embarrassment, while 12% of them consider it to be a curse by the God. Why is it so? Again, misinterpretation takes its place here. Since the day a girl starts menstruating, she is made to believe that it is sinful. And if we are ourselves considering it that way, how do we expect the society to behave normally to these things? Gandhiji once said, be the change you want to see in the world. And so, the day we change our reactions and our perspectives towards these natural processes is the day when we will be capable to say that yes, we are ready for a revolution 
and are really willing to break through all the taboos associated not just to gynecology, but any other social issue. All I have spoken about so far are not just the incidents that we face. Rather, they are to tell you about the small mistake which we all are making that does not allow any of the revolutionary concepts to come into play effectively. And now, speaking out about the idea to make this turn, it is the time for women to recognize what is being served on their plates and make the maximum of it. It is the time for them to know their potential and sharpen themselves in all possible skills. It is no more about turning the beliefs of the society or reforming the society. It's about women themselves willing to bring a change, to bring a revolution. And the day when we bring this into action is the day when we will no longer need any of the special treatments or privileges offered by the society. Why seek for special treatment when we are ourselves needing that equality in terms of gender? History teaches us not to repeat our mistakes. Then why are we planning for a society that will still have those discrimination because of the actions that we make today? Living in the new millennium, empowerment is necessary but not the solution. We have to make a perfect balance between our actions and our emotions. We need to show the society that women are no longer to be termed as pity. Rather, they are so capable that they can take a stand for who they are and for who they want to be. So girls and ladies, let's take a leap onto the roller coaster ride of recognizing ourselves, erasing our boundaries, spreading our wings, and establishing our names in the golden book of history. Let's all put in an effort to ensure that we have gender equality in the society in real terms. I would like to conclude my speech with these lines. And one day she discovered that she was fierce and strong and full of fire and that not she could hold herself back because her passion burned brighter than her fears. Thank you. It was an impressive speech that you came up with and I think it was an eye-opening for all the audience that are present here and the ones that will be watching you in the future because uh, you were the one who mentioned the difference between women empowerment and feminism and that definitely is something that every one of us uh, are something that we are entitled to know of because it's a misconception that we hold about the word feminism and today the youth needs to know the actual meaning of it. With that, I want to ask you a question based on your speech. Uh, the concept of empowerment uh, unchaste. How would you like to uh, elaborate and tell us that what do you plan to do in the future? What are your goals? What are your uh, aims moving forward? Okay, so like over the past two years, I've been working on projects on gynecology not just to ensure that I improve women's health on my journey, but also to spread awareness about these issues. I know what I spoke about was to ensure that women recognize what is being given to them rather than fighting for our rights. And on our ways fighting, we are just seeking privileges. So in the future too, I wish to continue on my researches. I wish to pursue for gender studies and ensure that gender equality really comes into existence. 
Thank you so much. I think that's something uh, that all of us present here, especially the youth, can take inspiration from. So with that, I would like to call upon our principal, sir, to felicitate Soumya. Everyone, please give her a round of applause. It is my honor to invite Mr. Sushil Kumar Pandey, he is an esteemed educator from Raipur, Chhattisgarh, dedicated to shaping the future of young minds in STEM fields with a rich academic background, including an MSc, Chemistry, and diverse diplomas. He has been serving as a STEM mentor and teacher of chemical sciences at Bharti Vidya Bhavan's RK Sada Vidya Mandir since June 2014. The approach involves personalized mentorship, customized learning plans, and collaborative workshops. Mr. Pandey's impactful mentorship is evident in the achievements of his students, including national winners at the CBSE Science Exhibition, Excellence at the Iris National Fair, and four students receiving the Pradhan Mantri Bal Puraskar for innovation. His strong communication skills and proficiency and relevant tools enable him to tailor mentoring strategies contributing significantly to STEM education programs. Please welcome Mr. Sushil Kumar Pandey. Greetings to one and all present here. I am today going to speak on a ripple effect of mentorship. During the course of my topic, in, uh, uh, during the course of my topic, I will take few names. These all are fictitious. Uh, as per the regulation of TEDx, I am speaking all this. Now, uh, let me take you to a journey, a journey which started with the curiosity of two young minds who are from my own school. The simplicity of their qu query started this journey. This narrative not only changed their lives, but set off a ripple effect, transformative ripple effect which affects the life of many others, including mine. Through, through the voyage, we will not only listen the story of some meritorious achievements, but also explore interconnectedness, a mentorship cultivate. In year 2016, just two years after I joined my present school, one day, two mentees, that whom I already talked in my opening, approached me. They were interested that I should guide them in their endeavor to qualify regional level science exhibition. But I have a different idea about the mentorship, which is totally different from conventional tutoring. I aspire to be a mentor who not only impart knowledge but also inspire, implant a belief in, the, in his mentees that dedication and hard work can change, can make seemingly impossible possible. I drew inspiration from my mentors who my mentor, whose own ascent 
is a testimony to the power of mentorship. I posed a key question to them that are you ready to do whatever it takes? Their resounding yes started a journey, a narrative which take this simple project to a greater height. It exceeded the boundary of that which a simple project can achieve. Together we started our journey into the realm of STEM. But this journey was not a mere endeavor to win certain com competitions. But we started it and it became an odyssey of efforts which marked by a thorough uh, um, uh, untying of each and every aspect of our chosen project. That's how the learning started. The very idea of winning a competition changed into a mission. Mission to cultivate curiosity, nurture a talent, uh, resilience, uh, nurture a resilience among my students to face the challenges. Now let's come back to the story which I started of the two mentees who initiated this process. The zenith of their project not concluded in the regional level science exhibition. It goes beyond that. They are catapulted to national and international levels. And the story concluded with esteemed recognition esteemed recognition of Pradhan, Pradhan Mantri Bal Puraskar. That was an evidence of their hard work, dedication to an exemplary work for that particular project. But again I am telling you the story not ends again here. It begins another story. It's a story of mine as a mentor. This particular project give birth and evolution of mine as a mentor. A mentor who is now not only equipped with knowledge and passion, but also a firm belief, firm dedication to take this transformative journey to the further. In the following years, I mentored not one, not two, not three, but a cohort of students under me. And Truly speaking, we went to all kind of STEM summits, all levels of science, uh, science summits, it's national or international. And we taken our flag of our bhavans, flag of our school to the, to the highest level, to the highest level. And the achievement of this collective cohort was not less than extraordinary. Seven, uh, six people reached to the highest STEM fair and out of that five were awarded. Two awarded with a grand award, two with a special award, two declared winners. It was the COVID time, that's how they, the competition not happened but they were there at the ISAF finalist. Even at the national level, out of seven, six won grand award. Genius Olympia, two of them won Rise Award, Rise Scholar, as well as uh, this uh, uh, Global Teen Leader. These all achievement. Whenever I discuss, whenever I think, feel me proud. I am the instrumental to all this. Their scientific endeavors were were covering every realm of the STEM. It started from, uh, it's, uh, it's including the, uh, it's including, it's including the complex designing of dis uh, uh, predictive disease model to, uh, uh, you can say, uh, cutting-edge development of, cutting-edge development of 
virtual training program for robots. It also included uh, that uh, uh, you can say uh, com com finding the complexity, complexity of the uh, microplastic in drinking water. It also uh, includes the uh, uh, profound suffering because of uh, fibromyalgia in humanity. It also includes PCOS, which is a prevalent disease in women, and uh, uh, you can say diagnostic kit in uh, diagnostic kit for NFLD. So all these achievements are not end at after that. To maintain the continuity and collaboration, we established a STEM club, an innovation club, where the new as well as seasoned mentees come together, they bind together. Senior mentees selflessly work for the junior, junior, their juniors' aspirations. This particular uh, support system not ends only at only at uh, uh, you can say uh, that uh, STEM projects. They are even helpful for their uh, pursuits in further educations. The story of innovation, collaboration, and mentorship is a testament to the fact that if our children will be guided and nurtured properly, they, are, they can come out with many unbound possibilities to win, uh, to, uh, win uh, various situations as well as uh, uh, things by which a humanity can evolve. In my journey as a mentor, I learned few lessons which I would like to share with all of you. First, first point is the power of mentorship. Mentorship begins at the very early age. You have to identify a mentee. Mentee whose dream you have to live up. Who, or he will live your dream. Like that you have to build a coherent relationship with him. Then, this, once this coherent relationship will be built, then when the mentor and mentee have the common dream, then the mentor by his knowledge and experience will pave the way and the mentee will follow that uh, way by his tireless working and make the dream come true. Second lesson is a testament to the fact that success goes beyond victories. What it means? It marks the journey of dedication and resilience. The second lesson, dedication and resilience. Now, a project or a STEM idea from his onset to the success passes through various competitions. Some of them come with accolades, some come with invaluable lessons. Lessons which lessons about their idea, their shortcomings, which can be further improved for their development. So, what I am trying to tell, it is a perpetual, perpetual cycle of refinement, which a mentor as well as mentee have to go. And dedication and resilience will work wonder in that case. Third and foremost, lesson which I learned, which is very, very important, is the passing over. Passing over whatever you learn, that is paying it forward. Now, many students think that ki once they succeeded, the mentorship ends, but it's not. It's the beginning of a new role of mentorship, that is the role which that student can play. He should 
pass on whatever he has learned whatever he has learned to the new mentees and that's what the the band which we have built is doing they are passing all that knowledge what they have to their young mentees and that's how we build you can say a dynamic group which is coming out every day with new and new uh, new projects and ideas which are ready to be unveiled now what i am trying to tell ki these three foremost points that is power of mentorship resilience and dedication and paying it forward is the secret how we achieved all this and with the this cohort we are going to achieve more and more and i suggest all new mentors that they should follow this is the secret which we are trying and you can also try and you can also build your own way by which you can also do this uh, this to the humanity because whatever you are contributing is contributing towards the progress of the human beings so on this note i am concluding and that ki we have to develop we mentorship uh, can develop a future where knowledge can be shared innovations in, uh, no, no, uh, innovations can be passed to the next generations thank you thank you sushil sir for uh, such a eye opening speech and having such a positive note to it with so many achievements displayed for all of us present here i think we are all in search of a mentee someone who inspires us someone who supports us whether we were back in school or we are during our graduation days or in our each and every walk of life so with that i have a question for you that we would like to know about your mentee back in your school and college days uh, and how did that particular individual shape for the way you are today so truly speaking uh, i was not that much lucky i uh, to have such mentees at my school days but i am lucky enough to get it when i started working uh, and that only inspired me to do and uh, even today when i am speaking here it's all because of those mentors because i am never been a person to speak uh, i am the person to work behind and uh, i challenge myself for this so may it succeeded or not i don't know uh, so uh, but i the, why i shared this the purpose of sharing this is that many people used to ask me how you did it so i tried my best to tell that secret which others can also uh, take a leaf from it and do that may they develop something new also so i would agree that everybody deserves someone to give us a push so that we take a step forward and maybe achieve ourselves something looking forward to you know a brighter future for ourselves so i think with that i will call upon our principal sir to felicitate sushil sir everyone please applaud him with a round of applause an investment in knowledge pays the best interest is the most powerful weapon to change the world in a beautiful way miss vanshika a fervent stem enthusiast and a proud epistemophile stands as a beacon of excellence 
Her accolades includes a third grand award at the Regenerate International Science and Engineering Fair 2023 along with Science for, for Science Community Innovation Award. She has emerged as an Inspire Awards Manak Awardee, claimed victory as the junior category winner at Ideathon, secured the first position in Techniche by IIT Guwahati and was amongst the top 12 teams in Sydney Innovation Challenge. Vanshika is set to captive audiences with her inspiring journey at this year's TED Talk. Please welcome Ms. Vanshika Degania. Ever felt like life is a series of snooze alarm, waking up to the same routine day after day? Or perhaps ever felt that life's remote control is stuck on repeat, offering you the same episode every day? Well, I was this random schoolgirl surviving through the corridors of high school a year back, until the universe decides to shake things up a little bit. First stop, my friends, goes back when I went to Delhi for this national fair. I was overwhelmed to see how people were so amazing in their fields. They had done so much work. Their depth of knowledge, their work spoke volumes. And all I'd been doing these years was simply trying to top my school examinations. And these people, they were doing some real cool stuff. But hold on, the plot thickens here. Let's fast forward to Dallas, Texas, where I went for an international fair. Again, those seven days there I was, it was beautiful. You know what the best thing about this fair was when I was at Dallas? I was in a room of people, the best of the mess minds from around the world. More than 80 plus countries, more than 1600 people. And their ideas were simply awestruck. And you know what? They, from finding biomarkers for suicide to say creating AI assistance for osteoarthritis, to say modeling brain network dynamics for people with autism. They had done work in various fields. And the even cooler thing about this fair was I had never met these people before in my life any time. Yet each one of them knew that the other person was extraordinary and had done something extraordinary in their own fields and saw the other person with the same mutual respect and admiration. That was beautiful for me. A year back, I was so naive thinking that the simple thought of going out of my comfort zone would sheer strain down my spines. But today, I'm savoring the taste of discomfort as the sweetest nectar of growth. So my friends, here I am to offer you some takeaways in my journey that changed my perspective. Here's the real revelation. I wasn't just a spectator in this world world of brilliance. Instead, I became a participant soon. From the halls of Delhi to the grand stage in Dallas, the series of metamorphoses lies in a series of profound realizations. And here I am to offer you three magic potions that can help you transform a normal teenager into a dynamic one who the world adores. So the secrets are to be revealed. Buckle up, my friends. It's about to get real. So no one told you life was gonna be this way. Da -na -na -na. Your job's a joke, you're broke, your love lies to you. Eh? It's like you're always stuck in second gear. When it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year. But I'll be there for you. Da -na 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 -na. I'm so poor at this, I know. But I can definitely see my friends from out there giving me the biggest, proudest smiles. Thank you for that. So how many of you, if you heard me right, how many of you feel that your life is sometimes stuck in second gear? Well, I feel it most of the time. Thank you. I think what we are told all these years, 12 years of our life, is all we have to do from class one to the end of our senior year is probably get up early, go to school, come back, do our course, get to bed, and then get up early again. Ta-da! For 12 years, that is what we have to do. 12 years, which is 4,383 days, 
approximately 20% of your whole life, we're doing the same thing as if that is our life. And I agree, that makes sense. But what I believe and what I gained out of my experience is that this is the period for you to get to know your potential. So my first magic potion for you all, here it is my friends, you need to break the loop. When we are in school, we're competing in a small group of people. But as we complete our senior year, class 12, we're thrown out in the world as if life be like, now compete and show me your A game. Ta-da. Well, I don't think so that is fair. When I came back from Dallas, I had made my mind that I'm not going to be doing the same thing same and again. People, the young minds I met there from around the world, they were doing so much more. They were doing groundbreaking research, handling their academics, perhaps running their own businesses. One person was literally doing everything. So here's the catch, my friends. If you want to transform your normal life into a dynamic one, if you see me here, you need to break the monotony of your life. And how do you do that? You do that by trying out new things. You do that by taking up opportunities, by being greedy for it. I said, try out new things. That is explore. That is the word, my friend. And that is the second magic potion that I offer to all of you. Well, let me ask this. How many of you are a Swifty out here? Come on. Well, I am a big Taylor fan. Do you know that there are international universities out there offering Taylor Swift courses? I mean, that is so cool. And I know all of us has played this game in our childhood. The Tom and Jerry one, which we call Pakram Pakrai in Hindi, which is simply to catch the other person around. Do you know that there is an international big league called as the World Chase Tag simply to catch the other person around? I mean, the opportunities are endless, my friends. All we have to do is explore and recognize the one which was made for us. I got the opportunities to be at this university in Bhopal. I went to Dallas. I went recently to IIT Guwahati just to recognize what is out there. I was exploring. I had tried different things like an investment competition and then something totally different like doing animations and graphics to explain a really tough science and math concept just to explore. You know what? Exploring is like road trip. Your high school journey is like a vast landscape waiting to be explored. It's like embarking on this beautiful road trip. You come across and navigate through the terrain of possibilities. You join different clubs, meet new people, and do different and crazy stuff. And like the finding trails in a hike. And now imagine in this road trip, you come across this scenic, beautiful overlook. Something that truly captivates you, that is truly resonating to you. That is the moment, my friends, where you realize something that is truly made for you. Now, by the end of the road trip, by the end of your high school journey, you're at crossroads. Now you have explored different paths, and now you got to decide which one to venture further. One that is truly made for you. This is the time where you zero on that breathtaking view you saw earlier, the one you discovered earlier. So my friend, the point that I'm trying to make here is that high school or afterlife is not a journey, not a destination to reach. Rather, it's a beautiful landscape to be explored. Enjoy the journey and then ultimately find the trail that leads to your own personal summit. A little too heavy, huh? Well, in this case, there is one player who plays it well, subtly, but very powerful. It is time. And here I give you my third magic potion, people. Time management. I know, I know, you've heard a lot about it. People talking about how to manage time. Well, let me tell you, it is an art not a lot of people can do. And my friends really adore the way I manage time. But I'm not bragging about it. Maybe a little. But yes, they do. They feel that I manage my academics. I manage my groundbreaking research work. 
and I also attend all the birthday parties and outings. I don't miss on that. So how do you manage time? Well, the trick here is, it's all in the mind. Your mind is the master. You need to start training your mind in order to manage the time. But how do you do that? That's the answer we need, Vanshika. So I call this trick the mind groove. Just like you change your step to different songs, you need to make your mind, you need to train your mind to adapt to different situations flexibly. It's like, say, suppose you are at this birthday party and then someone suddenly picks you up and throws you in your PJs at your home and says that now you got to study philosophy. So you need to train your mind to switch its mood and its natural rhythm and groove to different tasks differently. That's how you do it. And if I talk about how do you exactly manage time other than this, well, the very simple answer to this very complicated question is that it's not a very good question to ask. Because the only way you can do this is by start doing it. The only way you can manage time is by start managing it. I can tell you and I can give you a list of reasons how you can do that, but you won't be able to do that until you start doing it. You need to make a start point. Three things, my friends. First, don't avoid opportunities when they hit your door. Make sure you welcome them well. Let things in and then you see you will automatically arrange the time to handle those tasks. Second, my friends, don't be fearful to take up opportunities. I know a lot of us feel insecure and because we are naive in entering a new field about doing something new, because we feel there are people who have already excelled in that. I used to feel that my, myself. But you never know what could be your moment to shine as a shining star in the crowd. And third, and the most important one, take a chance. Because after all, at the end of the day, not all of us are good dancers, right? But we do and make our own hook step, right? To our own songs, to our own beats. That's what we have to do. And now, here I am, offering you another extra piece of magic potion. This genie has got you an extra one, and this is my favorite. I'm sorry, parents, but this is necessary. Have fun. If you think it takes all the sacrifices to give up on social media, to give up on binge watching, to be a child who has probably won some international awards and is standing in front of you narrating her narrative, I did not do any of these. I still have a lot of fun and I'll always be having fun while I'm exploring the landscape of my life. Let me tell you friends, you don't have to isolate yourself. You don't have to sacrifice all of these. Sit back. Loosen up yourself and enjoy this beautiful game called life. Well, before I conclude, here is the last thing. I promise, the last one. Do you remember the first slide of my PPD? Okay, let me help you out. This. What is that? Vanshika, are you trying to tell that you don't have a title to your speech? Well, I think this is the title to my speech. Yes with a little bit of addition. If I, to tell, if I were to call my narrative today something, I would call it untitled, because I still have got a long way to go. I refuse to encapsulate my story in a title, because title is not final. It is just a placeholder, and I'm still writing my story. I'm still unfolding the chapters of my life. So you gotta wait till the next sequel comes. I'll leave the story open-ended here. See you all. Until next time, thank you for being a lovely audience. Hi, Wanshika. Hi. That was a transformative journey and that you've shared with all of us. I think we all agree we do have those transformative journeys with all of us and we relate to the topic very well. There's some point in, in our life that's a, a changing point, that's a learning curve and we are all eager to see what's next. So I think this, this talk of yours, the untitled, very much relates with our audience today. So with that, I would like to ask you a question. How do you think your talk really resonates with the audience 
who is not really present here today in these walls, in these four walls. How do you think they, this will actually um, empower or maybe, you know, encourage the audience outside? I think the people who are not present here, um, probably the teenager around the world in India and abroad as well, mm -hmm. I think the purpose of me presenting this talk was to tell them how they can become from a normal kid to a dynamic one. Most often my friends come to me and they, they're really proud of me. But I also want, and they also want, to have this point in time where the world adores them. There's these two lines that says, in the hall of fame, I want the world to know my name. I think all of us want that. And for a normal kid, someone has to guide us to get that transformative journey. So that was this Ginny here to offer those four magic potions to everybody around the world on how they can be this dynamic kid out there. Thank you for the four portions that you've given us and we'll make sure that we have those in mind. Sure. Uh, with that, I would like to call upon our principal sir to felicitate Vanshika. Everyone, please give her a round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I kindly request Principal Sir to give a token of appreciation to Ms. Sonali Ghorke. Mr. Kevin Korea. On behalf of Bhartiya Vidya Bhavans, Akesada Vidya Mandir, I would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guests and audiences for their encouragement and support throughout the event. To all our speakers, you have truly ignited our minds, setting the stage for many inspired thinkers to soon be one of you. Your ideas have strummed in us as a chord of inspiration and enthused moral. Respected Principal Sir, your support and exceptional guidance have been instrumental in shaping our path to success. We are immensely grateful for your unwavering belief and mentorship. Respected Headmistress Ma'am, we want to express our gratitude for lending us your helping hand and mentoring us during our journey. A special thanks to all our teachers for their continual guidance and navigation throughout this journey. Our deep sense of gratitude goes out to Mr. Anush Prasad for helping us at every step of the way. He has gone above and beyond to bring out the best in our speakers and has truly left an indispensable mark through his presence. We would also like to thank Ms. Pranjali Magar, Ms. Sonali Gorke, and Mr. Kevin Korea for their assistance and guidance. I would also like to applaud the organizing team, volunteers and supporting staff for their tireless efforts in planning and executing. Your commitment, attention to detail and enthusiasm have made this event a resounding success. And last but not the least, to all the attendees, thank you for being part of this incredible TEDx experience. Your curiosity, engagement and open-mindedness have made this event truly special. We hope that the talks you have heard today will continue to resonate with you, spark conversations and inspire positive change in your lives and com communities. Let us continue to come together, share our talents and make a difference in the world. Thank you once again for being a part of this remarkable TEDx Youth at BVB Raipur. We, we look forward to seeing you at the future events and witnessing the incredible ideas that will shape our future. I request everyone to please stand for the National Anthem.
Thank you and good night to one and all present here.